Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and uh, a warm welcome uh, at the Medical University of Vienna. Uh, my name is uh, Marcus Mueller, and I have the pleasure to serve as the president of this university. And it's a huge privilege and honor for us to serve as the venue for this important uh, publication, which you have in your hands. The Lancet Commission on Medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust. Um, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the editorial board of the most important medical journal of our time, The Lancet, uh, in particular Richard Horton, editor-in-chief, who convened the commission, who wrote that report, uh, Sabine Kleinert, deputy editor of The Lancet, and uh, Miriam Sabin, here you are, uh, North America uh, executive editor of The Lancet, who are all present here today, uh, which underlines uh, the, important of the, the importance of this uh, publication. I would also like to thank the, the whole team of authors, uh, led by Sabine Hildebrandt, uh, Shmuel Reis, Herwig Czech, and many colleagues. Thank you very much for all your efforts. We find, uh, find ourselves today here in a very beautiful lecture hall of the so-called Josephinum, a building that was erected in 1785 in the age of enlightenment when Jefferson, Kant, and Mozart uh, were alive, a building that reminds us of the heyday of Austrian academic medicine, uh, mostly in the 19th century. However, the collections of this uh, museum uh, also uh, give evidence and bear witness of the dreadful time of our university in the aftermath of the Anschluss in 1938, when in particular many Jewish colleagues and patients suffered unbearable atrocities um, by the Nazi regime here in Austria. The glass containers uh, of the Spiegelgrund, a euthanasia institution uh, here in Vienna, which you can see downstairs in our collection, uh, which contained the specimens of murdered children, are telling objects in this regard. Given the destruction of Austria, Austrian medicine in, in 1938, and also the contributions of Austrian doctors to Nazi crimes, I think uh, this place is probably really, uh, in fact, a suitable venue for the publication of this important report. Today I'm also minded of the present rise of antisemitism, which we experience these days. I'm also minded of November 9th uh, as the day, date of the November pogroms. And uh, I would like to close with a quote of Churchill, which is very important also for me and our university, which, you, which all of you know. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And with this, I would like to uh, welcome you again and hand over to Miriam for your introductory remarks. Thank you very much. I'm not Miriam. <laughs> no, but it's a very nice name and maybe my parents should have uh, thought different. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all very much here, the ones present here and also all the ones who attend this uh, launch online. We have about 400 registered people, so I hope we all have an inspired afternoon. Um, my name is Christiane Drummel, to set matters right. Uh, I'm uh, responsible here for this building, I'm the director, and I'm also holding the UNESCO Chair on Bioethics at the Medical University of Vienna. Um, let me share a few words regarding this venue. The rector has already told that it's a building of the Age of Enlightenment, and Joseph II had it built uh, 
uh, and inaugurated as uh, Medical Surgical Academy to make, uh, to achieve a better education uh, for his surgeons. But uh, Joseph is also especially important for having been the first sovereign to tolerate the Jews after a long history of uh, exclusion and prosecution in his lands. To give them in his edict of toleration out of 1782 certain rights and duties, like going to school and to study. And thus he was paving uh, the way to the scientific achievements of the great Jewish doctors which constitute the success of the Vienna Medical School in the long 19th century until the time of the beginning of National Socialism in Austria. Every one of us who teaches in a medical school or teaches in history is confronted with various stages of ignorance regarding the Holocaust. Young students today come from different backgrounds and many of them do not know much about history other than people of my age group who pondered and asked their elders, how come you did not see what happened? What did you know? And especially, what did you do? So we have a moral obligation to not let be forgotten what has happened between 33 and 38 and 45. This is also why we commemorate uh, the November 9 uh, pogrom today, to not let it be forgotten. Medicine and power are dangerous uh, companions. We currently present a temporary exhibition about Max Schneider. He is a photographer who portrayed all the members of the medical faculty in the 1920s. Artful pictures and of all the doctors and many of them dismissed in 38 and stripped of all their rights. More than that, Max Schneider had the typical fate of that time. His studio had been Aryanized, never restituted, and he fled via India to the US. Um, it is there where the circle of my short introduction closes. And I want to give you this message from my side at the beginning of this afternoon. His sister-in-law was Lucy Adelsberger. She was a Nuremberg-born pediatrician, early specialist in allergology, working at the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, where she was dismissed in 1933 due to the anti-Semitic laws at that time. In 1943, she was arrested and deported to Auschwitz, where she was a Lagerärztin, a camp doctor. She survived and she wanted posterity to know about what had happened. She had memorized the details of her work, also lab values, because she thought that as extremely important, and all the dreadful experiences she has had and published them in 1946 in The Lancet as medical observations in Auschwitz concentration camps. And later, a book was published with her memories, which was translated into English in 1995, thus being a cornerstone of knowledge about medicine during the Holocaust. At the end of my words, I would like to quote her. Through misguided fanaticism, civilized people became beasts who not only killed, but also tortured and murdered with pleasure and joy. A bit of salon anti-Semitism, a bit of political and religious opposition, rejection of those who think differently politically, and itself a harmless mix until a madman comes along and makes dynamite out of it. One can understand the synthesis if things like what has happened in Auschwitz are to be prevented in the future. When hatred and slander quietly germinate, then it's time to be awake and ready. This is the legacy of those in Auschwitz, quoted out of Auschwitz, a factual report. So I thank you for your attention. I will continue talking to you as I'm moderating this afternoon until the coffee break. Thank you very much. And now Miriam. The editor of North America of the Lancet, please. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I would like to first acknowledge the participation of many of our Israeli commissioners uh, who are joining us today uh, via the link uh, from Israel. They were unable to attend due to the war that started with Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th 
but they are very much here with us in spirit uh, and also on their, on their screen. So I'd like to make sure that they're acknowledged and, and remembered um, as we speak today. I would also like to draw the audience's attention to all the launch materials that are available online at thelancet.com, but also at the launch's website. Um, and in your printed booklets for those of you who are in the room. This includes a Lancet editorial, followed by an important statement by the commissioners, the report itself that we are here to launch today, and other comments, and materials in an appendix, uh, which is available online, which includes important educational curricula that you'll hear more about later today. The final product, the piece de resistance. We are here today to launch and to learn about the work of the Lancet Commission on Medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust. The end result does not show you, though, who is behind the work of this commission, and it does not explain what engaging in the work of this commission has meant to the commissioners, to the editor of the Lancet, Richard Horton, or to me. I have been the editor of this commission in partnership with Richard, my fellow editors at the Lancet, the commissioners, and the Student Advisory Council for the commission. As we wrote in the Lancet editorial, this Lancet Commission is an example for all health professionals that truth and reconciliation may be possible. German commissioners, some of them of Nazi-era parents and others from former Nazi-occupied countries and Jewish people from the USA and Israel, some the children and grandchildren of Holocaust victims and survivors worked side by side to wrestle with this history and its implications for the health professions today. An International Medical Student Advisory Council provided a fresh view on the relevance of medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust, and were a future-oriented and optimistic presence. I was asked to talk briefly about what this commission has personally meant to me. We do not ever come to the study of history or to any work with blank slates, and neither did I. I am one of many examples of the American immigrant experience, and along with millions of other immigrants from Europe, my family fled the pogroms, anti-Semitism, and the poverty born out of excluding whole ethnic and religious groups, and left greater Russia and Eastern Europe for a new life in the United States. And like many others, some families stayed in Europe, and some went to British Mandate, Mandate Palestine. Although being in the land of promise in the U.S. as a child, I frequently experienced anti-Semitic slurs and bullying directed at me at school and in neighbors' homes on my street for being a Jew. When Richard Horton asked me whether I might be interested in working on this commission, I knew it would be emotionally challenging work, but I also knew it would be among the most important and meaningful work of my career. I was right on both accounts. I knew that my family had cousins who had been imprisoned in Theresienstadt, but it was only when I told my mother that I would be the editor for this commission did my mother tell me about other family and their fates, like my cousin, Sismund Sherman. Sismund Sherman was my grandmother's cousin, and the family came from Lodz, Poland. I discovered that Sisman was a known artist in Lodz and a member of a literary salon that continued during the ghetto. His paintings of ghetto life were hidden in the ghetto and rescued after the war. Sisman was presumed murdered there. It's another painting of his of ghetto life in Lodz. The Ghetto Fighters House Museum in Galilee, Israel holds his out artwork I discovered. I also discovered through my own research that Sisman did not die in the Lodz ghetto. A few weeks ago, I located records which show that he was deported to Auschwitz during the liquidation of the ghetto. Dachau records, however, verify that he was transported from Auschwitz to Dachau, where he died three months before the end of the war at age 28. Yes, we are not blank slates. But let us come into the light now. I am an editor at The Lancet because The Lancet is more than a medical journal. Along with the research we publish every week here, editors can convene world experts in their fields to call attention to important new evidence 
to address gaps and to make concrete recommendations that can change current thinking or clinical practice. And so it is with this commission. Thank you. very much and I would like to ask the editor Richard Horton, Richard Horton to come and talk to us behind uh, the scenes. <laughs> thank you very much Christian and uh, thank you Miriam for that very moving introduction. Rector Muller, Commission co-chairs, commissioners, student advisory Council. Technology. Technology. Um, Bill Seidelman, who I must acknowledge for his original idea that The Lancet should invest time, energy and commitment into a project such as this. Hervig for this event. I know the complexity of organizing something like this, and thank you for that. The huge hinterland of partners who have made this commission possible. And again, my friend and colleague Miriam, who's invested so much of her own personal energy and commitment into this work. You're about to see and learn the results of a quite remarkable partnership. I'd like to give some preliminary and personal reflections about the Commission, why and what, its meaning, and a warning, deeply relevant to now. Encouraged by my experiences working with friends and colleagues on a series of articles describing the successes and the challenges of Israel's health system published in 2017, Experiences that showed me, in my ignorance, that the Holocaust was not merely an historical event, but a living and guiding presence for many, if not most, of those I met in Israel. I used the months of lockdown in 2020 to immerse myself in a not so small part of Holocaust literature. Miklos, Nayisliz, Auschwitz, a doctor's eyewitness account, Robert J. Lifton's The Nazi Doctors, Ulf Schmidt's books, Justice at Nuremberg and his biography of Karl Brandt, Nicholas Waxman's A History of Nazi Concentration Camps, and most recently David Marwell's book on Mengele. And I remember thinking, reading those books, why am I in my mid to late 50s as I was then, learning about this history only now, at the end of my medical career. Why was I not taught this history while I was a medical student? So central is it to the conception of a doctor. Not only to learn about the complicity of doctors during the Holocaust, a history of such shocking and momentous importance that it deserves a place in the medical curriculum for that very reason alone, but also to understand the origin of modern research ethics, to provide an opportunity to reflect on the role of the doctor in society, to ensure that medicine plays its part in the fight against racism, including anti-Semitism, and to underline that our shared fate is a manifestation of our shared kinship. Medicine is practiced today as if the Holocaust never happened. It's the purpose of this eloquent, powerful, and compelling commission to erase that complacency. Your commission examines a particular period in history, but it has universal lessons for humanity. First, the fundamental importance of individual human rights and the core values of dignity, autonomy and equality that all health professionals have an obligation to protect. Second, 
the crucial significance of compassion towards and in defence of all vulnerable individuals as part of our irreducible commitment to health equity. Third, our shared humanity and our calling to prevent inhumanity. Fourth, the imperative of educating morally aware health professionals who have an essential role in responding to societal predicaments and crises. Health professionals as social agents for change. And finally, the urgent need for each of us to continuously assess and reinforce the values of health and health care, notably the right of every human being to the availability, accessibility, acceptability and quality health care. Now let me briefly try and draw these lessons together into a more complete conception of our society today. Drawing on the lessons of the Holocaust in a book of far-reaching importance, one that I return to again and again, the Israeli philosopher Avishai Margalit set out his vision of what he calls the decent society. The decent society is a society that does not humiliate. Humiliation is the violation of the respect a human being deserves for the very fact of being human. Humi humiliation doesn't mean that your rights have been denied. Humiliation means that you have been prevented from even demanding those rights in the first place. He writes, in a decent society, there are no second-class citizens. A decent society must not use its institutions to demonise those who are dependent on it. A decent society must also restrict its humiliation of its enemies. In Margaret's words, and I quote again, it must not dehumanise them through demonisation. Humiliation is the treating of humans as non-human, as if they were objects or animals or in other ways inferior. The opposite of humiliation is respect. And respecting human beings means never giving up on anyone. To quote Margaret again, every person is capable of a future way of life that is discontinuous with the past. Respect comes from the fact that the future always remains open. Now it's hard today to conjure up the atmosphere of the 1930s as the Nazi killing machine took shape. But here is one example. Joseph Roth took a train from Berlin to Paris on the day that Adolf Hitler was officially sworn in as Ger Germany's Chancellor, January the 30th, 1933. Roth considered himself Austrian, born in 1894 on the eastern edge of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a region that is now part of Ukraine. He studied German literature and philosophy at the University of Vienna, but his participation in World War I and the subsequent collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire turned him into, as one of his book's titles says, a wandering Jew. From Paris, he observed the creeping growth of Nazism and the awesome indifference of the rest of the world. Roth condemned journalists who reported only what they were told about Germany in the 1930s and not what was really taking place. These journalists closed their eyes, they refused to see. The world had become numb, sceptical to reports of truths. He mourned the killing, his word, of a European conscience, a solidarity of European culture in a climate of growing anti-Semitism 
he argued that every person of whatever race was of equal value. And he predicted that when the war was over, I quote, in a year, in a century, woken from its narcosis, Europe will feel a pain that nothing will be able to relieve. His books were all burnt by the Nazis in 1933. Destitute in poor health, addicted to alcohol, he died in May 1939. His wife, Frederica Roth, interned with schizophrenia in a psychiatric hospital here in Vienna in 1933, was in 1940 one of the first victims of the Nazi T4 euthanasia program. In an essay he published in December 1934 entitled Pitiless Combat, he wrote that, I quote, a writer cannot possess genuine worth if he is not in possession of the following traits. One, compassion for oppressed peoples. Two, love of good. Three, hatred of evil. And four, courage to proclaim in a loud and clear voice unequivocally his compassion for the oppressed, his love of good, his hatred of evil. The task of the writer, he wrote, in our time is to engage in pitiless combat to be true to these traits. The most important work of this commission, work that we hope you will allow us at The Lancet to be deeply engaged in with you, begins now, today, tomorrow, and every day thereafter. It is nothing less than the struggle for the fabric of society, for the fabric of civilization, the struggle to heal the divide between morality and utility, the struggle to remain human in inhuman conditions and times. Dear co-chairs, dear commissioners, I could not be more proud of what you have achieved with this commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. We come to the second part of this uh, launch, uh, which is called presentation of the report. And there will be uh, three co-chairs who are presenting. And uh, the very first one is Herwig Czech. He is professor for the history of medicine at the Medical University of Vienna. Please. I was indeed uh, involved in the planning of this event, but I should have been more careful to avoid speaking directly after Richard Horton, which is an, uh, quite the, the task. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for attending this event uh, here at the Josefinum in, in Vienna but also a special welcome to all those who join us today on our live stream. Uh, Christiane has mentioned that we had hundreds of uh, registrations and I hope that most of them have turned into uh, actual uh, logons. Our Lancet report consists of three core elements. They are reflected in the subtitle, um, historical evidence, thank you, implications for today, and teaching for tomorrow. And of these three, it is my pleasure to introduce the two parts of the uh, Lancet report that are dedicated to providing the historical facts, so the, the, the basis for the whole argumentation of the reminder of the uh, Commission. The main goal uh, of this enterprise and of this uh, section particularly is to provide the global readership of the Lancet with an up-to-date compendium of the facts that we think every health professional worldwide should be aware of. None of this, and this is also important to stress, none of this would have been possible without the work of many, many colleagues in the field over decades, which I would also like to expressively um, acknowledge. The scope of topics that we uh, cover, as you will see or have already uh, seen, is uh, considerable. In the short time that I have now, I can give a quick overview, but I think it's important to just uh, also reflect the sheer uh, 
uh, depth uh, of the um, of the issues. So the, the first part is dedicated to the period up to 1945. Uh, we, we don't start with 1933. There's an important uh, history before this uh, to be uh, told, of, ready, of course, and to be uh, analyzed. So the first uh, section, if I can give you an idea of uh, what we are uh, covering, is, the, is Germany before 1933, uh, the situation of the medical profession. Physicians joined the Nazi party in greater numbers than any other profession. And uh, I think this is an effect that uh, we need to be aware of, that needs to be known, and that also demands an explanation. And what we're trying here is to put this into the context of developments of the profession in Germany and also later in Austria from the First World War to the beginning of the Nazi regime. The systematic exclusion and persecution of Jewish health professionals. As soon as the Nazis came into power in 19, 1933 in Germany, and five years later also in Austria, Jewish physicians and health workers were persecuted, they were expelled from their positions, they were forced to flee, and it was in Berlin and in Vienna, that most, among the most important medical schools of the time, where this persecution took on the most radical forms. Nazi ideology, the unique role of medicine within the Nazi regime cannot be understood without the thorough comprehension of the Nazi worldview, and particularly with its uh, biomedical elements. Eugenics and medical genetics. Uh, eugenics provided the basis for the regime's agenda of so-called racial hygiene, and these are also elements, and this is an important uh, point in our report, these are also elements with a distinct international dimension. Uh, there were eugenic movements in many, country, many countries around the world. Forced sterilizations and abortions. During the Third Reich, more than 300,000 people were forcibly sterilized because they were considered to be genetically unfit. This was a massive campaign. It uh, also required a massive amount of medical resources, of personnel, which means ultimately that the great number of public health officials and healthcare workers in Germany and Austria needed to collaborate for this to become possible. The public health system in service of the folk. As we explain, the whole public health care system of Germany was in essence turned into an instrument in the pursuit of the implementation of so-called race hygiene, the vision of a genetically and racially pure German people. The Nazification of medical education and the health professions. Professional organizations, healthcare institutions, and universities were permeated with Nazi ideology, including a very specific version of medical ethics that was aligned with this worldview and became also an important uh, instrument in the implementation of the medical uh, program. Medicalized mass murder, we've heard uh, a number of references to this already, also by Richard Horton. Um, a core topic of the report, the extermination of more than 230,000 people with disabilities or psychiatric illnesses under a number of distinct campaigns, still often used, or referred to today using the euphemism that was also preferred by the Nazis, euthanasia. Coercive research, another core aspect of our commission is the forced human subject research that was carried out in concentration camps, but also in many other contexts. Many have heard the name of Josef Mengele, but this was a much broader phenomenon involving tens of thousands of victims. Medicine and the exploitation of forced laborers. Before, and then especially during the war, more than 20 million people were forced into labor in Nazi Germany, more than 20 million people. And this also included medical contexts in many dimensions, of course, an area that has long been neglected by the research. And that's why we also dedicate a special uh, section to this. 
persecuted and murdered health professionals. In every single country that fell under German uh, occupation, Jewish health professionals were persecuted, deportation, de deported to, to camps and ghettos and murdered. And the ghettos created by the Nazi regime all over Europe, but particularly, of course, in, in Poland, in occupied Poland, among other countries, there were places of immense suffering. But we also find examples of resilience and resistance of Jewish health professionals who, under the most unimaginable conditions, tried to continue to care for their patients. And finally, for this section, medicine in concentration and extermination camps. As we all know, the purpose of the camps was exploitation and extermination. But there were also medical facilities under the direct control of the SS, whose functions included the performing of forced medical experiments. And with this, I move to the second part of the report, which is also still dedicated to the history. Um, here we deal with the aftermath of what happened under the Nazi regime, and this covers a whole series of topics that are relevant up to the present, as, as we think and as we are trying to show. Early post-liberation reactions. So how did the world react to the revelations of what happened uh, under the Nazi regime, to the revelations of the horrific crimes committed under Nazism? Um, one response to these revelations were criminal proceedings, and the most important of these was the Nuremberg doctor's trial. Another response uh, were attempts to establish binding international norms for medical research on human subjects. Uh, this is why we have inserted this uh, subsection on post-war debates on medical ethics, bioethics, and the Nuremberg Code, with the Nuremberg Code one of the most prominent outcomes of these early uh, debates and attempts to respond to Nazi medical crimes. We also deal with the health effects of Nazi persecution. Survivors often suffered and continue to suffer from the consequences of persecution with important implications for medical knowledge and for their medical care. And such knowledge, medical knowledge gained in unethical contexts is another important aspect such knowledge was gained from coerced research or from the use of the bodies of Nazi victims. The most important example, also if we refer to, to Vienna here, is of course the Anatomy Atlas of Eduard Piankopf, but there are many other examples all over Germany. Some of this knowledge is still part of the medical canon, and this is a fact that, in our view, needs to be acknowledged. The German medical establishment after 1945, and this also includes the Austrian medical establishment, as we describe, German and Austrian medical institutions after the war mostly tried to avoid any confrontation with their involvement in Nazism. And this also meant, among other things, a heavy burden on the survivors who were denied compensation and who were denied any kind of public or social recognition. And this brings me to the last, but certainly the most important point, which comes under the title From Silence to Commemoration, Recognition of Victims. As we lay out in the report, identifying and recognizing the victims as individuals took a very long time to develop, and it is an ongoing obligation. This is also one of the key recommendations of our report, with which I want to conclude my short overview. And I quote from our report, victims should be identified and memorialized as individuals. Further investigations are needed to continue identifying the victims of Nazi medical crimes and to reconstruct their individual biographies. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask now the second of the co-chairs uh, to come and give her talk. It's Sabine Hildebrand. She's an associate professor at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. She's an anatomy educator with a research interest on in the history and ethics of anatomy and a focus on anatomy in Nazi Germany. Please. Thank you so much. 
So we've heard, just heard about the historical evidence that our Commission believes needs to be known by all health professionals around the world. And I will present now the uh, implications from this history that we have identified that are really necessary to be known. This is our Commission at work during one of the very, a few meetings that when at least some of us could meet in person here in Jerusalem. At the time, we had gathered the basic historical evidence that we believed needs to be known by everyone, and now we were gathering some thoughts on implications of this history for medicine and health professions today. Our brainstorming occurred in one of the now routine hybrid meetings around the globe and around the clock. This is the result of our deliberations, and this is the short list, I would like to say. The original list had a, around 120 right, uh, implications, um, but what clearly emerges just from this multitude is that the history of medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust is relevant for every field of medicine and healthcare. It is relevant to today's perceptions of and debates in medicine and in the public. We were able to formulate a core of five implications from the multitude, implications that we contend are relevant for health professionals everywhere. The central insight from this history is that the atrocities that health professionals committed during the Nazi regime and the Holocaust represent, to a large degree, the outcome of corrupt moral agency in the face of potential dangers that are inherent to modern scientific medicine as it emerged in the 19th century. While medicine holds immense potentials to benefit humanity, it can also harm, and this is true at all times. However, it took the specific political conditions of the Nazi Germany to transform these potential dangers into the particularly radical manifestations we document in this commission. The moral agency of health professionals became distorted through opportunities and temptations offered by the Nazi regime. Recognizing this potential, within medicine and its practitioners through interactions with states, employers, or other authorities is important to understand one's own agency. In this context, preventive steps must be taken to counteract an ever-present risk of medical injustices or infringements of fundamental human rights. Our, record, our rep report discusses some of the specific risks linked to such factors as opportunities to abuse medical power, the tendency to objectify patients and research participants, dilemmas about split loyalties, and temptations to abandon basic values for ideological and opportunistic reasons. The core values and ethics of healthcare are fragile and need to be protected. They require constant critical assessment and reinforcement. Health professionals in Nazism were not without ideas of their professional duties or medical ethics. They developed a specific form of ethics that put the health of German people above all those considered to be outsiders, thus excluding vast numbers of individuals from their care. This exclusion followed eugenic, anti-Semitic, racist, and other discriminatory criteria and supported Nazi policies. Few health professionals did not question this distortion of their ethical duty towards the human beings in their care. This history provides a unique possibility to explore the aims and limits of professional ethics and how they change over time, dependent on cultural, social, economic, and political factors, particularly when put under pressure. Therefore, professional ethics in healthcare constantly needs to be critically assessed and reaffirmed to ensure that it st stays aligned with core values specific to medicine and to avoid becoming exclusionary and inhumane. That was one too far. Courage, resistance, and resilience are necessary to prevent and counteract potential abuses of trust, power, and authority in healthcare. 
extreme forms of misconduct and abuse of power can be studied and analyzed in the well-documented context of medical involvement in Nazism and the Holocaust. At the same time, this history provides remarkable examples of physicians and other health professionals' resilience in the face of challenges and resistance to these temptations, pressures, and coercions. These included refusal to follow the requirements formulated by the eugenic sterilization law and refusal to cooperate with the genocidal patient murder programs. Even more remarkable is the broad range of resistance efforts of Jewish and other persecuted health professionals, particularly the struggles of physicians, midwives, and nurses to provide medical care in the ghettos and concentration camps. These examples show that such courage, resistance, and resilience is not only necessary, but indeed possible. Health professional practice and the pursuit of scientific knowledge should occur within a framework that prioritizes individuals' human rights. The physicians and medical scientists who performed coerced human experiments during the Nazi era often followed the scientific rationale of knowledge gain. They believed that scientific validity was their only obligation concerning professional ethics. They did not consider the extreme cruelty of their methods and the unbearable suffering of their victims, and certainly did not prioritize these individuals' human rights. However, protecting and respecting human rights are primary obligations for health professionals, including those working to enhance scientific knowledge in medicine. Only under conditions of informed consent is the pursuit of knowledge through research on humans justified based on respect for dignity, autonomy, and equality of every individual human being. And finally, and more important today than ever, health professionals have particular responsibilities in fighting against anti-Semitism, racism, and other forms of discrimination. They have distinct credibility to challenge false scientific claims made by anti-Semites, anti -Semites, racists, sexists, and other bigots. And they are in key positions to prevent, detect, document, or remedy human rights violations such as torture and mistreatment in detention settings. This is true not only in the practice of healthcare, but also in education and research settings. Further, health professionals can act in the political sphere because it is especially necessary to sustain the provision of appropriate care to vulnerable populations, historically marginalized groups, and those in regions affected by war or conflict, thereby counteracting human rights violations that may even include crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. We health professionals know that there is no, <clears throat> no factual basis for claims that human beings are fundamentally different or of different value. Rather, we know through our education and daily practice that we all share the same human body in all its variations, the same human spirit in all its variations, and the same human rights. We all own dignity and deserve respect. It is our responsibility to practice, stand up for, and proclaim our shared humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. And before I can announce the next speaker, I would like to inform you that there will be ample opportunity later on for questions and answers in the second part of this uh, afternoon moderated by Herwig Czech. But now it's my pleasure to announce Shmuel Reis, who is the third co-chair of this report. He's a family physician in northern Israel and faculty in the Holon Institute of Technology, 
where he oversees the new Bachelor of Science in Digital Health. He's a former academic head of the Center for Medical Education in the Faculty of Medicine, Jerusalem, and former head of the School for Competencies Education in Residences of the Israeli Medical Association. Please, the floor is yours. What a shame for faculty in the Technological Institute of Hulon not to be able to raise the podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> it's a privilege and a great honor to be standing before you to launch the third part of our report, Education for the Future, Education for Tomorrow. Now that the evidence-based history and its ensuing implications have been laid out by my fellow co-chairs, we can in the next 10 minutes build on these foundations the theory and practice of turning history and implications to educational interventions. The paradigm that emerged Okay. The paradigm that emerged in the report process is history-informed professional identity formation to be elaborated upon further in a few minutes. However, since we are entering a discourse of identities, allow me to share my own, my own personal identity first. I'm dedicating this presentation and my involvement in the commission to the memory of my grandfathers. My name's sake, I'm called Shmuel Pinchas Rice. Pinchas Rice, and uh, Shmuel Arbuz, perished in, in Malthausen, not far away from here, in the winter of 1944. A month ago, the October 7th pogrom took place. For most Israelis, few, if any, degrees of separation from victims of this dark day exist. I am no exception. Ayelet Arnim was murdered in a music festival together with Segev Kishner, both neighbors, of my 300 families community in the gallery. Eli Margalit, about my age, was slain in his house in kibbutz near Oz. Now this is going to be complicated. He is my cousin's, Renana, husband's uncle. My cousin Renana is another granddaughter of Shmuel Arbus of the former slide. And his daughter, nearly 41 years old, was abducted and taken hostage to Gaza. I trust that you all will join me in praying for her safety and speedy return. Back to the report. The rationale for the goals, sorry. The rationale for the goals of medical education of the report is that it aims to develop educational approaches that promote ethical conduct, moral development, and formation of professional identity based on compassion through so education on medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust. The rationale is that learning and reflecting upon this history supports the formation of morally courageous, resilient professionals, ideally equipped with greater capacity to confront current and future challenges, and a professional community with greater capacity to shape and support this across all its members. We have identified three medical education paradigms 
that best inform the search for fulfilling the aforementioned goals. The first, CBME, competency-based medical education. Here in its most prevalent form, uh, the Canadian one, CANMEDS, where the six petal-like competencies converge to create the medical expert. And the competencies are derived from an analysis of societal and patient needs. In the report, we present two curricular examples in panels 26 and 27, uh, 25 and 26. However, in the appendix, which you have not received in your booklet, but is available online, we map these curricular examples to CanMed's competencies. So this is how it serves uh, uh, as basic for the education uh, portion. The second paradigm is the informative, formative, transformative paradigm. It was actually launched into mainstream medical education by another Lancet Commission, the one on medical education in 2010. Julio Frank was uh, heading this commission. And I, I must say it was all the time in the back of my mind until we uh, started to work in the commission and suddenly it was obvious that this is uh, very much in fit informing what we did. It was also borrowed from Harvard's Grober Keegan, and it postulates three levels, and also says that the highest aim of medical education, sorry, is to achieve the transformative level, where you create enlightened change agents and leaders uh, and, in the two, and, and also within a transformed healthcare system. The informative level is where you uh, teach knowledge and skills and you create experts. The formative, knowledge, uh, lev the formative level is where you create an identity and form professionals. And the transformative level I've already indicated where it should reach. The third uh, construct is that of professional identity formation. I will not go into it, but later on, and Hedy especially is going to elaborate more about it. But as I said, we have defined uh, uh, the new paradigms that we think that the report presents as history-informed professional identity formation. And where it uses knowledge and reflection on, on the history of the profession to build moral agency among professionals, thereby enhancing capacity to serve as stewards of the shared professional, professional values. At its core is, and it was already mentioned, critical reflection on what professional values and priorities ought to be never blindly accepting existing professional structure and culture or propose changes to this, but to critically scrutinize them, examine their origins, assess the alignment between one's personal values and those of the profession, and examine both for areas of weakness. The final new as well construct I wish to share is the notion that all of the paradigms mentioned has to do with the moral education of the health professional. It's above and beyond ethics training, a necessary but insufficient teaching. Because we think that other things such as uh, evolving from moral sensitivity to moral behavior and um, uh, it identifies moral agency and moral courage as desired competencies and acknowledges the ubiquity of moral distress in a medical reality. Medical, moral distress is what happens when a practitioner acts in conflict with, with his own morality. And in the pandemic, it loomed large that 
most, if not all, people who are practicing in these conditions experience moral distress. Moral distress can turn into a moral injury, which wounds the practitioner and can result in burnout. And our research shows very, very well that burnout is one of the drivers of the humanization in medicine. So we really hope that all this will feature into the moral education of the physician and hopefully uh, result in some prevention of moral injury, burnout, dehumanization, and that coping with moral distress become a competency that all health professionals have to uh, learn. Okay, enough of theory. Moving to operationalizing the most theoretical uh, part of our work. The practical aspects are presented here, no, here, uh, by a roadmap for curriculum development and is supported also by the, the appendix. Uh, the roadmap is a method of, of designing curricula. Uh, it goes into content, pedagogies, assessment, and faculty development. And it, as I said, supported by a primer on medical education in the appendix. It, in the appendix, you can also find many more case histories, such as you can find in the report itself, so that you can, people can choose a case history. There are 40, I think, of, of them, and use them as the basis of a module of teaching. There is a roster of syllabi. We identified 18 of them that we think are exemplars, and a glossary with translations of German terms. This is graphically presented, and you can uh, move as an educator or an education leader from the core knowledge that you think you want to convey to the implications that you uh, want to uh, embed in it, and then the practical uh, considerations of content, uh, course length, audience, uh, uh, target audience, where does it fit with the curriculum, etc. Choose the levels from informative to transformative and choose the depths from basic to uh, advanced. And in panel 27, we end with 11 recommendations. I'm now going to read all of them for you. No, don't worry about that. We'll take only a few examples. Uh, for example, recommendation number two, use the history of medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust to emphasize the, the unique opportunities and responsibilities of health professionals in the elimination of anti-Semitism and racism. Or, number eight, create experiential learning opportunities, including visits to historical sites or museums, when possible, and historical case studies that represent real-life approaches to learning. And finally, nine, use reflective exercises to consolidate informative and formative learning and to create opportunities for transformative learning. Finally, there are three educational outcomes that I feel uh, summarize everything that we said in the report and what I said until now. Two of them, may sound new, I haven't elaborated on them, but later on I hope that we'll be able to uh, further discuss them. The first, at the end of an educational intervention of medicine, Nazism and the Holocaust, the learner should recognize the potential for abuse of power inherent in healthcare and actively seek to prevent it from oneself demonstrate moral agency and courage, speaking up when necessary, and incorporate prevention of crimes against humanity and genocide to her ethos and competencies. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will uh, 
go to an important part of the report, and that's the Student Advisory Council. We will see in a few minutes uh, the president uh, or the chair of the Student Advisory Council, and she will give a contribution. But before that, I would like to uh, present uh, the council. They are a diverse group of health professions, students from the fields of nursing, neuroscience, bioethics, public health, health administration and medicine. And they had an application explaining their interest and thoughts on the subject matter, which was supported by a mentor recommendation. And I would like uh, to uh, say their names. Um, and they are Muhammad Atala Arcia from Indonesia, Cristina Becherano Roma from Spain, Shubham Gupta from India, Chiniere Jennifer Igwe from Germany, Yi Meng Jin from China, Clemens Jobst from Austria, Abigail Leibowitz from USA, Georgia Livieri from Cyprus, Emma Nalianya from Kenya, Mercedes Podromo also from Austria, and Catherine Reed from the USA, and uh, Runak Verma from India, Max Stone from Canada, and Dali Jakub from USA. And uh, now I would like to uh, announce Shani Levani. She has just graduated from medical school and will start residency in pediatrics next year. Her grandmother is a Holocaust survivor, one of Mengele's twins, and this legacy is one of the main reasons for her choice to pursue a career as a physician and for interest in medical and the Holocaust education. Please, Shani, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, so, as I was presented, my name is uh, Shani Levani, and over the last two and a half years, I had uh, the honor of being the head of the Student Advisory Council uh, from now on SAC. Uh, in addition to the privilege of working with the extraordinary commissioners and with the wonderful Miriam Sabin, uh, I had a real honor uh, to lead the SAC, a group of intelligent, curious, caring, and highly professional students. Um, the SAC was assembled with the notion of adding a diverse uh, perspective to the Commission, uh, and as Christiana said, uh, uh, they are from various healthcare uh, uh, professions and from a wide range of uh, countries. Over the last two and a half years, uh, we have met once a month to expand our knowledge on medicine, system, and the Holocaust, uh, to discuss questions that were uh, given to us by the commissioners, and to... Sorry, I'm just going to bring it up. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a bit taller than the rest of them. <laughs> just saying. Uh, so, uh, to just to discuss our perspective and opinions on the Commission's work and uh, to work on uh, creating a wider understanding of the relevance of medicinalism and the Holocaust education in different regions of the world and to help each other learn and develop uh, uh, local education programs uh, on this history. So today you've heard and you will, heard, you will he hear the many important conclusions and recommendations of this uh, uh, commission and the report. Uh, but I would like to use this stage uh, to address students and learners uh, in the audience, uh, in their homes, and uh, even the future students of, of all of you here in the uh, audience. Um, and I would... <clears throat> And I would like to say that there are many important reasons to teach medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust, um, and I'm leaving it for the commissioners to say, uh, but I'm going to try and convince, convince you why it's important uh, uh, to learn it. And because we are, I think, mostly uh, uh, healthcare professionals here in the room, uh, I'm going to use 
a case study uh, to show you why it's important uh, to learn this history. And I'm going to use some of the uh, some of the ideas and, and uh, uh, the products of the work of the SS SIC. So the case report is going to be uh, my own. Uh, I want to share with you some of what I have dealt with in the last month. I am from Israel, born there, raised there, uh, lived there, and I have every intention to continue living there uh, until the day I die. Uh, I am the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, one of Mengele's twin, uh, who you will see uh, later on in a, in a film. Um, and I finished my medical school this past summer, so in many ways my story and my legacy are what we call medicine and the Holocaust. I'm telling you these things about me uh, because it's important to me that you'll understand the context of what I'm about to say uh, and know that everything I'm going to share with you is a first-hand experience. On October 7, I was at my parents' house, a two hours drive from uh, my apartment in uh, Beersheba and from the hospital I work in, uh, Soroka University Medical uh, Center, also in Beersheba. Uh, and as soon as I realized that what was happening that day uh, was not regular, uh, I jumped into my car and drove as fast as I could to the hospital while rockets are flying over my head. Uh, and I did it because I, I knew that Soroka Hospital would receive the uh, majority of, of casualties uh, as the largest hospital in southern Israel. When I walked into the emergency room, I was hit by a ghastly smell of fire and smoke, of burnt flesh and of blood. That was the first time in many to come that the word Holocaust popped in my head. It reminded me of what Holocaust survivors have described about the smell of the crematoria in Auschwitz. I do not refer to the word Holocaust lightly. It is not ordinary for Jewish people, let alone direct descendants of survivors like me, uh, to call something anything, no matter how bad it is, uh, to call it a ho holocaust. Moreover, in this community of, of uh, um, medicine and and the holocaust educate, ed educators, it is very uh, uh, not common to use the, the Nazi card, to use the holocaust card, or even simply just making comparisons of the holocaust is something that we are very careful with. So when I say that the word Holocaust surfaced in my mind the moment I entered the ER, I do not say it lightly. Uh, I say it with humble intentions and with awe and reverence to the magnitude of this word. The word Holocaust kept surfacing in my mind, made me aware of the important messages of the commission and of how this history was influencing me in that moment, in that present, in that very ER room, ER, yeah, uh, and just like in the commission's title, it was implications for today, and that today was my current present. So back to the ER. The sights in the ER uh, were as horrific as the smell. Um, and let me set the scene for you. There were so many injured that the hallways were blocked and passing with a gurney was impossible. People screaming in pain, crying from agony, wandering around, lost in despair, looking relentlessly for the loved ones. But what I, I, noticed, what I noticed was that while some students and interns and maybe even residents um, were <clears throat> confused by, by the countless uh, uh, tasks to do, it seems that they were not able to express empathy or compassion for the uh, uh, patients and family members, some of whom were panicked looking for their loved ones. 
And I immediately started to do all these forgotten tasks. I was aware that the little things can really help patients feel that we as doctors uh, care about them. I gave some of my patients my cell phones so they can call and speak uh, uh, with their families. Uh, I worked on trying to connect families uh, with their lost uh, uh, family members and more. And when I reflect on the reason why I immediately knew uh, what would bring comfort to my patient and make them feel that I cared about them, I realized it wasn't just because I received great clinical uh, um, training during my studies, uh, but it was because I have been immersed in the experience of the Holocaust through my family uh, experience, uh, but also um, I have been mindful about the practical learning and reflection, including uh, uh, being part of developing coursework on medicine and the Holocaust. Through learning about medicine and the Holocaust, I was much better prepared, even in the middle of a mass casualty event, because I had learned and thought about resource allocation, about showing compassion, about triage and uh, uh, prioritizing, of getting informed consent, of medical confidentiality, and of primum non nocane. And in fact, I was realizing that I was putting into practice all the ethical and professional algorithms that I have been teaching and learning uh, through my work on medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust in the past five years. Um, well, I have developed for myself these uh, uh, ethical algorithms, which are a set of questions that I ask myself while practicing medicine. Uh, in order to get a better understanding of the ethical and moral aspects of the situations I, I may encounter or had encountered at that moment uh, as a health professional. I also think that learners should want to learn about medicine, nazism, and the Holocaust because this history nurtures the learner's ability to think critically and to understand the importance of critical uh, uh, thinking in, dis in distinguishing how to reflect and, and act as a compassionate and ethical health professional, even in awful circumstances. So to learners listening to me now, I say, if you want to also be equipped and prepared to manage even a day that is unimaginable, you will need to reflect and learn about medicine, nazism, and the Holocaust. To educators, uh, policymakers listening to, to me now, I say, if you teach it, you will be contributing to the stre strengthening of your students' professional identity formation process, and you will provide them with practical tools to ethically practice in medicine. Never again is now. Thank you. And I would like to present the next part of uh, uh, our agenda today. Uh, so we are going to hear a testimony by uh, the Chengeri twins, which are my grandmother, Leah Huber, and her twin sister, Judith Barnea, who both uh, uh, were in Auschwitz and, and and Mengele uh, uh, experienced on them and on their uh, mother. Uh, and this is their uh, testimony in rela relation to the, the report and its uh, recommendations. Thank you.
1937 בשמלו סילבני, הונגריה, וב-1944 נכנסו הנאצים להונגריה, ואחרי לא תקופה ארוכה לקחו אותנו לגטו, שם היינו ארבע שבועות. בתנאים מאוד קשים. מאוד קשים, בלי תנאים אנושיים. ומשם לקחו אותנו לקרונות, קרונות של בהמות, בלי אוכל, בלי מים, בלי תנאים. בלי שירותים. בלי שירותים, בלי שום דבר. אחרי חמישה ימים הגענו לאושוויץ, הרכבת נעצרה. הורידו אותנו עד שתיים מה... מהקרונות, ופתאום אנחנו ראינו בחוץ אנשים לבושים עם... בגדים עם פסים, אנחנו ירדנו למטה, ותוך שנייה נעשתה כאילו סלקציה, לקחו את כל האנשים, ואימא שמעה... נפרדנו מהמשפחה, לא ראינו יותר את המשפחה. נשארנו רק עם אימא, אני... בצד אחד, אני החזקתי את היד של אימא, בצד שני אחותי, ופתאום מישהו קרא צווילינגה, צווילינגה, ואימא אמרה שיש פה תאומות. רצו להפריד בינינו ובין... בא איזה אס-אס שהוא ממש רצה לקחת אותנו, התחלנו לבכות, אז הוא אמר, טוב, שנישאר עם אימא. לקחו אותנו לצריף, איפה שכל אחד כאילו נהפכנו מאנשים למספרים. כל אחד קיבל מספר. למחרת לקחו אותנו למרפאה, ושם עשו לנו כל מיני בדיקות. וזריקות. והשוואות בין חלקי בין גוף. בין אחד לשנייה. והכניס אותנו לבלוק של התאומים. כמעט כל יום לקחו אותנו ל... במנגל ב- ב- או איזה... איזה... קצין אס-אס. ולקחו אותנו למרפאה, ושם המשיכו אה, לעשות כל מיני ניסויים. שנורא הכאיב לנו, ו- 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 והיה מאוד קשה, ולפעמים גם קיבלנו מכות, ומאוד מאוד פחדנו, וזה המשיך. למרות שפחדנו, כל הזמן באו ולקחו אותנו ל... והפחד הכי גדול שלנו היה, שראינו שהרבה תאומות שלקחו, חזר רק אחד. לא חזרו שניכם, ואנחנו נורא פחדנו. שלא ש... יעשו לאחד מאיתנו משהו שאנחנו לא נוכל לחזור ביחד. חוץ מהפחד והזוועה, מה שעברנו שם, שאנחנו לא רוצים להזכיר את זה, זה מאוד עזר לנו, עצם העובדה שיכולנו להחזיק ידיים וחיינו ביחד. אנחנו לא רואים את כל הסבל והזוועה של מה שעברנו. אבל מצד שני, יש לנו... אי ביטחון. אי ביטחון, הרדות ופחד. ופחד מהרופאים. אף אחד לא יכול לתאר לעצמו את הפחד, מה שיש לי, לגשת לרופא. מאוד חשוב לי שאנחנו הולכים לרופא, שהרופא יחשוב על ה... פציינט אחרי המחרה נמצא בן אדם עם נשמה שמי יודע מה הוא סוחב ו... כל החיים זה שלו. זה לא חשוב אם הוא היה בשואה או שלא היה בשואה. אף אחד לא יכול להבין את זה כמו שאנחנו מבינים את זה, כמה שחשוב להתחשב בתור בן אדם, לא, לא, לא רק בתור פציינט. <laughs> ואני מקווה שאחרי כל הדברים האלה היפים, מה שרואים שהדוח הזה נותן ושעושה, אף פעם עוד לא יקרו דברים מה שאנחנו עברנו.
sorry. We will come to the keynote of this afternoon, keynote implications counteracting in humanity with humanity, a perspective of Confucian global ethics about the last report on Nazi medicine. And the speaker is coming from far away. It is Ying Bao Ni, a professor at the Bioethics Center at the University of Otago, New Zealand. And to describe a bit what he's doing, among his nearly 150 peer-reviewed publications, a book like Behind the Silence, Chinese Voices on Abortion, Medical Ethics in China, and Japan's Wartime Medical Atrocities, and the articles in leading international bioethics and medical journals. Rooted in China and Asia, he has put forward a distinctive theoretical and methodological approach to global bioethics called ethical transculturalism. Please. Kara Kuto Katoa, greetings in Maori, the language of indigenous people in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, thanks for Professor uh, Christina. Thanks to Professor Sabine, Nancy, the team, the commission for your invitation. I'm privileged to be with you all today, including our colleagues and the people online. Being back in Austria, again, it's even more exciting uh, because in recent years I've been obsessed with listening to Western classic music, novel everything by Bach and Nate Beethoven, all the symphonies by Bruckner and Mana. New Zealand, a big village, uh, nicknamed for the home of the Midland in the epic movie, The Lord of the Rings, has been frequently ranked globally as one of the most peaceful countries. Unfortunately, no place on this planet can be free from violence driven by ideologies. From a perspective of a global ethics rooted in classical Confucianism and in a big brush manner, my presentation will address two questions. Why is it necessary to respond to inhumanity ethically humanly? What has the Lancet report this report has achieved. The following slide is the one I have used the most frequently in teaching for undergraduate, postgraduate, and medical students and talks in different countries. It is very, very difficult to look at and reflect upon this large-scale death toll in the unit of meaning. Despite the impressive progress during this period, the non-20th century is equally notable for massive destruction. Note that this is a highly selected list. For example, Chinese civil wars that claim the meanings of life do not include here. Some of those were not directly associated with the war. The famine in China in the late 1950s and early 1960s, worst famine in human history, with 20 to 40 million deaths were caused by such political campaign and the social policy as Great Forward and People's Commune Movement. Even medicine, the science and the art of healing was harnessed to the state killing machine. Nazi, Nazi medicine on which the Lancet report focuses, including eugenics, euthanasia, 
home experimentation. As you know, I hope you know, there was the East version of Nazi medicine, mainly for developing biologic weapons, Japanese doctors and scientists conducted barbaric experiment and the way we section on thousands of people from early 1930s to the end of the Second World War. Japanese army carried out bio wars not only on battlefields, but in villages and towns, including a town near my village, very near to my village. In contrast to the aftermath of Nazi medicine, justice failed gravely here. Japan's war, medical war crimes were never mentioned in Tokyo trials. The funding of the Soviet Union Kobolavisk trial was dismissed as communist propaganda in the West for more than three decades. After the war, most of the Japanese perpetrators either committed, continued the flourishing careers, including become the leaders of the postal of medicine in Japan, uh, certainly enjoyed the comfortable retired lives. This failure of justice was due to many complicated political and historical facts. The postal of US authorities committed a complicity after the fact by making a secret deal with the perpetrators to manipulate the perceived precious scientific data from inhumane experimentation. Other facts, including Japan's notorious official denial and the Chinese nationalists and the communist government's negligence in pursuing justice on behalf of victims in the international community. If all this death, suffering, and humiliation can be weighed on the scales, they will be much heavier than the, all the sea sands all together, even though we may not actually hear any victim honing like a caged cat. In the face of this ruthless inhumanity, we should not fear into despair. We are not powerless and resourceless, although they appear to be helpless, as not to be able to even move a finger. Our fundamental moral senses can serve as part of the most potent source to prevent resist and hopefully overcome inhumanity. As you all know very well, immediately after the defeat of Nazis, Karl Jaspers, as a knight in dark times, examined the question of German guilt and put forward the penetrating idea of four types of guilt and responsibility, individually and collectively, criminal, political, moral, and metaphysical. These four types of responsibility should be extended to interacting in humanity today and in the future. Also, Jaspers wrote about classic Confucianism as part of a spiritual and intellectual foundation laid during the Axial Age, upon which humanity had subsisted in history and still today. Indeed, Classical Confucianism remained relevant to China and the world in the 21st century. Confucius and Moncius to other shining light in dark times, endowed the humankind with the ethical outlook and the principles that I would characterize as realistic idealism. This spirit 
of realistic idealism in many moral traditions of the world served as the shared moral ground for world-changing international human rights movement. For Mencius, all human beings have a heart sensitive to the suffering of others who offered a vivid illustration. If a human were suddenly to see a young child about to fail into a well, the person will certainly be moved to try to help, not because of any utilitarian reasons, but simply because of our heart of compassion. In Mencius' time, like Confucius, China was plagued with war between different states, collective violence, and the collapse of traditional social order and moral cult, like us. Confucius and Mencius were actually aware of the problem of home cruelty, wickedness, moral failure, and the persistency and large scale of this problem. Still, they never lost faith in human nature's inherent and universal goodness. Classic Confucianism is a system full of courage, wisdom, and thought confronting humanity with the humanity and the barbarity and the barbarism with the morality and the civilization. Now, we have come to the second part of my presentation. My general reading of the Lancet report is this. Manifesting the spirit of realistic idealism, it has not only refuted certain unethical approach to past the atrocity, but embodied the ethical way of counteracting in humanity in the context of medicine and medical education. Some popular but unethical mode of responding to past um, atrocity exists. Deny, first, the denying. All the Holocaust denial has been widely discussed Denying past atrocities is far more common than we would like to believe. For just one example, Chinese participants always twisted the death toll and the causes of Mao's Great Famine. Also, a more, a more subtle but a dangerous way of dismissing the duty to remember is an indifferent or even cynical attitude that treat past inhumanity as the problem of other people, other places, and other times that have nothing to do with us and today's affairs. Second, misdefining the nature of past atrocity. Among some prominent but distorted views are characterizing perpetrators, devils, monsters, mad doctors, bad apples, and inhumanity through a nationalist ideology. Third, distorted collective memory and of past inhumanity often feel future atrocities. Nationalist historical discourses contribute to the vicious circle of statewide state and the collective violence. In other words, never forget is necessary but can be insufficient to achieve never again. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary to use a phrase from Nuremberg Code about informed consent to respond to past atrocity ethically, as the Lancet report has constructively demonstrated. Its first salient the merit lies in respecting and seeking historical truth. Based on solid historical evidence, the report produced a most updated compendium of what occurred and why such atrocity happened, particularly why doctor and scientists willingly designed and implemented those atrocities. From the beginning, a characteristic of Chinese civilization emphasized the role of history and historical truth because of Confucianism. 
Confucius' most important work on the ethics of social political life and the interstate relationship. Chen Chiu, the spring and the autumn, was written in the format of annuals. It featured historians who sacrificed their lives for Bin Bi Zi Su, recording historical facts truthfully. It is said, and heartwarming as well, that at its extraordinary personal cost, including career and even life, many activists, writers, scholars in China resist officially sanctioned historical amnesia and distorted collective memories about ideology-driven disasters such as Mao's Great Famine and Cultural Revolution. I should add, my parents and me are survivors of these man-made digesters. We come from what classified class enemy family. The second insight feature is that editor of the Nancet and the Nancet Commission have pointed out the imperative of teaching Nazi medicine in today's medical curriculum and the Nancet report offered innovative and pragmatic educational program for this undertaking. Please read this from bottom up. For Confucianism, we are not born, but constantly learn to be human. Cultivating morality is essential for nourishing our individual character, promoting world peace, or humankind as a more commonwealth loving people and abiding by the highest goal. The third key achievement of the report is that it underscores the necessity and present a practical educational program for future health professionals to reclaim and cultivate the moral sense of common humanity individually and professionally. The belief in a common humanity has constituted a basic moral perception across geographic boundaries and historical periods, as illustrated by numberless works of literature, musical, and visual art, as the circle of Bach's church cantatas, Beethoven's and Manner's symphonies, among many others. However, from the early 20th century, this foundational ethical perception has been substantially undermined, at times totally shattered, shattered by large-scale historic events, social political forces, and the intellectual movement. At the beginning of 20th century, William Osner, one of the greatest physicians, delivered an address to the Canadian Medical Association. For him, chauvinism and nationalism constitute the great curse of humanity, are dangerous for medicine as the oldest, most beneficent, and universal guild. He predicted that nationalism in medicine would disappear due to the higher moral claim of human brotherhood. Unfortunately, in the 2020s, in the face of Nazi medicine and the Japan war and medical atrocity, we can no longer share Osner's optimism. Nevertheless, we should never give up his moral ideas, which are Confucian moral ideas too. Rooted in classic Confucianism as Christina mentioned that I put forward and still developing this um, theoretical and methodological approach called ethical transculturalism. And through my uh, research journey on uh, a number of different bioethical issues in China, East Asia, whether in a global context, its central element is about not only focus upon cross cultural differences, but also discovering the transcultural similarity and the common morality, particularly reclaiming the moral sense of common humanity. 
According to Monsius' well-known doctrine of four beginning, the feeling of compassion, shame, respect, and the right and the wrong are the beginning of four cardinal virtue, realm, humanity, humanness, or beneficence, love, yi, righteousness, justice, ni, right, zi, wisdom, courage. The heart of compassion is possessed by all humans alike. Likewise, the heart of shame, the heart of respect, and the heart of right and wrong. The Confucian idea of medicine as art of humanity or humanness, yi nai ren su, has renewed relevance for our politically divided world further dividing world, politically divided world. This most fun fundamental principle of traditional Chinese medical ethics extends the Confucian doctrine of Ren in health care. This night shows the first two sentences of Nen Da Yi Jin Chen on excellency and the sincerity of master physician, the counterpart of the Hippo uh, Hippocratic Oath in China. Although they are difficult to translate it into German or English accurately, just those, these words, Hanin, Pu Tong, Yi Den, literally mean all human beings under heaven, all beings with a soul, universal, equal as one group, unquestionably reveals the Chinese moral sensibility of a common humanity in the area of medicine. It's time to conclude. From a perspective of a Confucian global ethics, the Lancet report is a landmark achievement on Nazi medicine, today's medical education, and the future of medicine, manifesting the spirit of realistic idealism it constructively and richly demonstrated the ethical ways to counteract in humanity with humanity. This including these three. First, respecting historical truths and seeking historical truths. Second, promoting moral cultivation individually and professionally. Third, reclaiming a sense of common humanity and constantly upholding in Confucian terms the norm and ideas of medicine as the art of humanity. Hard for your uh, congratulations uh, for this achievement. In my teaching on what a medical atrocity East and West, I always finish the last session with this night by asking my students to be silent for a moment with me in memory of all the victims of medical atrocity and the numerous cases of unethical medical research and practices globally. Thank you all, including colleagues and the people online. So thank you very much. We are almost at the end of the launch of the first part of this afternoon. And uh, I would like to invite this time, Miriam Sabin, uh, to uh, give us her closing remarks. Please. Counteract inhumanity with humanity. I thought that was such a simple but elegant, uh, beautiful, way to characterize what we're talking about here today. Thank you. 
This is the first time a Lancet Commission is dedicated to the history of medicine, and I think you'll agree it was very much needed. Professor Jing Baoni, thank you also for putting the report into a universal context in regard to atrocities, which are unfortunately globally experienced, but also to shed some light on and provide some hope and some paths going forward, uh, rooted deeply in, in your history and humanity's history. So thank you very much for that. I do hope you found the launch informative and received the key messages of this report that our student council leader, Shani, so eloquently described. Studying the lessons from medicine in the Nazi era and the Holocaust prepares us, even in the most difficult circumstances, to respect the dignity of the individual patient and to respect the importance of biomedical ethics, including in research, a problem we consistently have today and for which we must remain vigilant. At The Lancet, we do look forward to watching the progress of medical academia and societies to vigorously take up the recommendations in this report and to include these teachings in the curricula of all health students. So on behalf of The Lancet and to our commissioners and all our speakers today, thank you very much. So we are at the end of the first part, and I can only thank everyone who has been giving his contributions, moving contributions, and very uh, future wise ones. And I would like to invite now everyone for the coffee break. If you go out here, you go always uh, to the right-hand side until you come to the lecture hall and their coffee will be waiting for you. And I also have the uh, pleasant duty to remind you that in half an hour uh, it will continue with the symposium and Herwig Czech will host uh, this symposium um, as moderator and uh, therefore go now and have a coffee. Thank you. So.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for the second part of this afternoon of what uh, already is a memorable uh, event. Now the second part we're going to dedicate uh, to the report to going further in depth of uh, the elements of the report uh, with a, a tense program. And I'm very uh, grateful to you for attending. Thank you for being here. Also to the audience that is joining us via our live stream. I would also like to use the opportunity to explicitly acknowledge and welcome the members of our commission who cannot be here uh, today. There is uh, Anna von Villiers and Astrid Lai from Germany, Sari Siegel from the United States. They all had their own reasons why they could not be participating today uh, here in the room. And for the sad reasons that we all know, Tessa Schlusch, Miriam Offer, Avi Ori, and Matti Fox in Israel. Before we start, I would like to remind you that we will be collecting questions. We'll be we'll having a Q&A session at the end of this um, afternoon or end of this uh, event. There's also a possibility to post your questions on the event website. You don't have to retain them uh, until the end. There's a Slido application uh, implemented on the event website. Probably most of you have already uh, figured it out. And there you can uh, send your question. It is now my great pleasure and honor indeed, I see him already on the screen, to welcome our next speaker, our keynote speaker. Speaking to us from Israel is Professor Dan Michmann. And personally, I have to say, I could not think of a, a better person, of anyone better placed to be talking to us today. Dan Michmann is Professor Emeritus of Modern Jewish History at uh, Bar Ilan University. And he's also, importantly, the head of the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Israel's uh, Holocaust Remembrance Center, Yad Vashem, in Jerusalem. He's also, if I may say, one of the most uh, foremost historians of modern Jewish history, anti-Semitism, and the Holocaust. Dan, I'm very happy that you can be here with us today, not physically, but as we discussed earlier, thanks to modern technology, in spirit, and uh, via this uh, link. And I hand over the floor to you, please, for your keynote speech. Thank you very much, Herwig, and dear audience. So first of all, I have to apologize for not being with you in person, <coughs> but instead addressing you via Zoom. Uh, as said, I'm delivering this address now from Israel, which is, as you all know, and has been mentioned before several times, involved in a war against the Hamas terror organization in the wake of an unprecedented, brutal, barbaric attack on Israeli citizens, kibbutzim, and villages uh, exactly a month ago. This situation, which affects us all here personally, makes it difficult to concentrate on apparently pure academic issues. However, the recent events, though being different from the Holocaust, evoke associations with certain situations in the Holocaust. <laughs> Among them are also moral dis decisions that have to be taken in the field of medicine. I will turn now to the event of today, the launching of the report, which was composed by the Lancet Commission on Medicine, Nazism and the Holocaust. And this event was scheduled for the meaningful date of the 9th of November, on which we commemorate the so-called Reichskristallnacht, or the November pogrom, the night in 1938, in which anti-Jewish pogroms were carried out all over the German Reich, which at that moment included already Austria and the Sudetenland. In this pogrom, <clears throat> which was the concluding peak of a series of minor violent anti-Jewish so-called Einzelaktionen in a month before, many of them in Austria, about 1,400 synagogues were set afire and demolished. Torah scrolls were desecrated and burned all over the country, and hundreds of Jews were arrested, brutally treated and molested, and even murdered and incarcerated in concentration camps. This eruption of anti-Jewish violence became one of the representative symbols of the Holocaust because of the explosion of violence 
although it preceded the unleashing of the comprehensive murder campaign of the Jews by two and a half years. Historian Alon Confino, in his fascinating book, A World Without Jews, The Nazi Imagination from Persecution to Genocide, uh, which was published in 2014, pointed to the deeper meaning of the burning of Torah scrolls during <clears throat> the pogrom night. According to Confino's analysis in Nazi fantasies, and I quote, Jews represented time, symbolizing evil historical origins that had to be eradicated for Nazi civilization to arise. The existing world order was based on the idea of human equality, originating in the Jewish narrative of all human beings being descendants of Adam. Thus, Jews represented the past, and the key link with the past had to be severed. Crystal Knight expressed this motivation and goal. <clears throat> in this context, the question is, what is the importance of the Lancet Commission on Medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust report from the perspective of our understanding of the Holocaust, that is, the Nazi anti-Jewish enterprise? Historical research on National Socialism including the Holocaust and medicine, is not new. The fact that medical theories and perceptions played a role in racism and eugenics and consequently in the Nazi Weltanschauung and practices was obvious already for contemporaries, but came to the fore from the legal and ethical perspective when a limited number of senior doctors, 23, were tried in the 12 so-called subsequent Nuremberg trials by the American occupation authorities and afterwards in a limited number of additional but more low-key trials. This caused this, this issue to find its way into some immediate post-war period studies and publications that attempted to comprehend the Nazi phenomenon. The emphasis, however, was at the time <clears throat> on the criminality and unhumaneness of the personalities involved, with a focus on the experiments carried out on concentration camp prisoners, especially in Auschwitz, which limited the discussion and prevented it from tackling broader conceptual aspects from the perspective of historical analysis, though it had certain implications from the perspective of ethics. On the other hand, as most of the German doctors, healthcare practitioners, and administrators in the medical field during the Nazi era continued their lives after 1945 uninterrupted, and even making apparently honorable careers, among them human geneticist Ottmar von Fraschur, who had played an important legitimizing role for and carried out unethical medical transgressions during the Third Reich, the topic was largely suppressed and marginalized in public discussion and perpetrator research in Germany from the end of the 1940s through the 1980s. As German perpetrator research was dominant in research on Nazism in general, the result of this state of affairs was that the extent of research into this topic in general was very limited. Moreover, influential medical institutions actively blocked research on the topic. Consequently, the coping with this topic in the professional world of medicine, both in and outside Germany, was limited. A real breakthrough in research can be observed only in the 1980s in Germany and in some other countries. I cannot go here into the particulars, I have done so elsewhere. But this development in the 1980s in the field of medical history of Nazi Germany did not happen by chance. It should be seen as part of the emergence of a larger generation of scholars, some of them young contemporaries during the Nazi period, or those who were born in the immediate post-war period, that criticized both the so-called intentionalist approach, which had focused on the ideology and policies of Hitler and the Nazi elite, and the so-called functionalist approach that, although looking also at the participation of lower echelons of the Nazi bureaucracy in the decision-making of the Nazi state, essentially focused on structures, ministries, and organization in an impersonal mode, when names were mentioned, but it was merely as epithets. The new generation of researchers had a more individualized approach and focused therefore much more on biographies, 
highlighting the roles and careers of a variety of personalities from all parts of society who were involved in the Nazi project. Architects, environmental planners, corporate managers and employees, etc., etc. In this broadening scope of research, the medical professions also drew new interest. Yet it would take the German Chamber of Physicians, the Bundesärztekammer, many more years before it decided to publicly apologize for the crimes carried out during the Third Reich by the members of the profession individually and collectively. With the publication of the so-called Nuremberg Declaration in 2012. As for the Jewish side, a considerable number of Jewish survivor historians, some of them originally physicians, also wrote studies about medical issues during the Holocaust with a focus on activities within Jewish society. But this remained fragmented and occasional, and the interest in the topic declined after the first surge until the late 1980s, when interest started slowly to grow again. Yet only since the turn of the centuries, a real upsurge in research can be observed. We can summarize this overview by saying, first, that many partial studies on medicine and the Holocaust were and are still written by interested doctors. Yet in the past two decades, some, not too many, professional historians have moved into this topic. Secondly, regarding Nazism and the Holocaust, real-time ideological, political, cultural and social positions and developments impacted immensely on the course of medical practices, which escalated from medical care to medical non-care, or more explicitly, to criminal medicine as far as the perpetrator aspect is considered, and they impacted on health care in extremis as far as the Jewish aspect is considered. Nevertheless, many issues of the vast domain of medicine during the Holocaust wait for proper historical examination, and until now, there was no comprehensive overview of the field which could serve as a basic text. Moreover, the findings in this field should be well integrated into the larger picture of the Holocaust. Next to the focused field of medicine and the Holocaust in the mainstream research on the Holocaust in general, and there, when we examine the genre of comprehensive studies of the Holocaust, many of which became bestsellers, and I won't go here into uh, names of books and authors, it is astonishing to see that they include only a flickering from the broad field of activities in the field of medicine during that period. But even in the studies that gave attention to the topic, the focus is on medical experiments carried out on Jews, and they are viewed as byproducts of and as benefits from other developments. The much broader, indeed, the vast field of medicine and the Holocaust within the larger uh, picture of medicine and Nazism is out of scope. It is very influential, though in my eyes, per extremely problematic study, Modernity in the Holocaust from 1989. The sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, who to a large extent based himself on the study by Raoul Hilberg, The Destruction of the European Jews, originally published in 1961, claimed that the Holocaust, in his interpretation, a modern genocide was, and I quote, a rare, yet significant a reliable test of the hidden possibilities of modernity. In his view, it was probably impossible for Nazi Germany to arrive at the idea of genocide as part of a grand vision of a radically different society, and now I quote again, without the entrenched practice of medicine, both of medicine proper, aimed at the individual human body and its numerous allegoric, allegorical applications with its model of health and normality, strategy of separation and technique of surgery, end of quote. This is an interesting observation and perhaps not untrue, but it relates to the idea of medicine in general, as Bauman perceived it with his concept of modernity and its dangers. It does not deal with the realities of medicine in the service of Nazism, and definitely not with the functioning of medicine within the Jewish sphere at the time, and disregards the many dimensions of what we call medicine, 
which in fact is a family name for a broad variety of professions and attitudes. If we look at the interpretations of the Holocaust as made by the major schools, from Hilberg through the intentional and functionalism debate to the post-1990 newer approaches, we will see that they all focus on the final solution as being the final stage of a development, its ultimate peak, trying to trace a logical path towards it. In this context, scholars neglected or disregarded a whole set of activities that apparently could not be interwoven into the process leading to the murder campaign. Medicine and healthcare is one of these neglected activities. When it is mentioned at all in comprehensive analyses of the Holocaust, it appears either in a very vague and general way or as a subsection of the implementation of other factors. And here comes in the report which is being presented today. Next to an in-depth survey of ethical issues emerging from the behavior of academics and practitioners during the Nazi period for present day medical education, the research-based report provides for the first time a concise but comprehensive and contextualized historical introduction into the picture of the field of medicine during the Nazi period with a focus on the Holocaust. The historical chapter precedes the discussion of the ethical issues. By doing so, the report has created a scholarly tool which is both helpful for scholars of the Holocaust who haven't until now paid attention to the topic and for institutions training people in the field of medicine and healthcare who were until now ignorant regarding the historical context of the ethical issues raised by the derailed medical science of the Nazi period. In a former session, Professor Tech had already mentioned the sections of the historical overview, yet I think it is important to repeat them. They include an overview on Germany before 1933 and the situation of the medical profession, a focus on health professionals as victims of systematic exclu exclusion and persecution, a short explanation of Nazi ideology and its relevance for the issue of medicine, a zoom in on the aspects of the role of eugenics and medical genetics in enabling the deterioration of moral standards through apparently academic justifications, the practice of forced sterilizations and abortions as part of a state program of so-called race hygiene, a special chapter which presents the real-time voices of victims of forced sterilization, an overview of the public health system in the service of the folk, an extremely important chapter on the notification of medical education and the health professions, two lengthy and penetrating chapters analyzing and describing medicalized, medicalized mass murder, euthanasia, in Germany and in the next or occupied territories, a spotlight on the criminal coercive research on human subject, with a special chapter, of course, on Josef Mengele and his experiments, medicine and the exploitation of forced laborers, and an extensive description of the Jewish dimension. Health professionals as victims of persecution and extermination during the Second World War and medical activity in the ghettos under the Nazi regime, with some examples of Jewish doctors. And finally, medicine in the concentration and extermination camps. Afterwards, there is another lengthy chapter on the post-war period which deals with the repercussions, impact, and extent of coping with the criminal legacy of the medical and healthcare professions. As any concise historical, historical overview, I'm sure that important aspects can be added, data be updated, and certain interpretations be debated, which will lead to an even improved version of the report. There is a joke which says, what is a camel? And the answer is, a horse composed by committee. Yet camels are still important and helpful creatures. And so is the report. The medical and historical academic community, which counts many experts, should be invited to comment on the report and thus start a fruitful discourse. This survey from which I, as a Holocaust historian, but not a medical historian, learned a lot, leads to the first conclusion 
of the report, and I quote, the atrocities health the uh, professionals committed during Nazism and the Holocaust represent, to a large degree, the outcome of corrupt moral agency in the face of potential dangers that are inherent to modern scientific medicine as it emerged in the 19th century. I agree with this conclusion from the medical perspective, but would add the importance of modern anti-Semitism as an important component in this process too. This leads me to a final observation. Recently, I've proposed a redefinition of the Holocaust or Shoah, the terms that should be used according to my understanding for the entire Nazi anti-Jewish enterprise, which started in 1933, not just as a synonym or synonym terms for the final solution. So my uh, redefinition goes as follows, the, the vision that stood at the heart of the entire Nazi anti-Jewish enterprise was that the world, the universe, should be totally cleansed from what the Nazi Weltanschauung perceived as the Jewish Geist, the Jewish spirit, the idea of human equality, an idea originating in Judaism, an idea that polluted, haunted, and undermined the world in Christianity, liberalism, socialism, communism, Bolshevism, capitalism, democracy, music, art, and literature, and more, because it ran counter to the natural or the so-called natural principle of hierarchy. Hitler proved to be a most successful transformational leader. That is a leader who has the ability to activate people to such a degree that it changes society. People from all over German society and Austrian society were ready to be activated by the Nazi vision and participate in its anti-Jewish enterprise because the ingredients of this vision were not entirely new and they were usable, especially because of the economic and post-World War I mental crisis, which destabilized, destabilized German and European society. And end of my of this def the definition. The Lancet Commission's report shows very well that the many anti-Jewish activities taken in the field of medicine and healthcare, either by professionals, state bureaucrats, self-proclaimed or academically raised and trained racial experts, commissioners of cities in occupied countries, etc., should be situated in this context physicians, psychologists and psychiatrists, nurses and administrators of medical institutions, and officials in the field of healthcare, as individuals and as a collective, try to implement in their domain, many of them voluntarily, the goal that Hitler, the Nazi party, wanted to achieve, beyond anything that they were requested to do. With the help of Darwinist and eugenic theories, they even had a professional justification to do so. And thus, they, with their tools and views, medicalized the Jewish and racial problem, medicalization meaning defining political or social issues as medical problems and rate, relating to them in medical terms. From this perspective, the contribution of the entire medical profession in Germany to the rapid change of German society immediately after the Nazi rise to power in 1933 and afterwards was considerable. So thank you for your attention, and I hope that the report will indeed find its way both to the institutions and organizations in the field of medicine and to the broader community of Holocaust scholars. Dear Professor, Michmann, uh, thank you so much for this enlightening uh, keynote. I think it was very helpful to have put the work of our commission and the report which was published in the broader context uh, of Holocaust historiography by such an eminent historian. For the moment, I think we are very happy about the camel we managed to achieve by committee. But as Richard Horton is untiring in reminding us, the day after publication, we'll get maybe some sleep, the day after publication of the commission is when the work really begins. Um, as I announced at the beginning, we'll have a Q&A session at the, at the end. So then I very much hope you will be able to stay with us in, uh, to, for the Q&A later on.
because now uh, we are moving on to the next panel. It is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Volker Röhlke. We are in this next panel going back to the historical facts that I presented uh, in the first part. So we are going more in depth, more in detail. And uh, Professor Röhlke, apart from being a very, very dear colleague, is Professor of History of Medicine and the head of the Institute for the History, Theory and Ethics of Medicine at the University of Gießen in Germany. Uh, his research focuses on Nazi medicine, on its repercussions after the Second World War. He's also one of the founding uh, directors and still a, a co-director of a large research project on the history of brain specimens, the use of brain specimens of Nazi victims in the context of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, now the Max Planck Society. Without much uh, further ado, Volker, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, hmm? Yeah, I would like to, to move. I don't read anything. Don't move too much <laughs> because of the cameras. Hmm? Not too much, no. <laughs> this spot? <laughs> yeah, but I, I also want to see my presentation without turning around. Okay. So, thank you for the introduction, Havik. Um, I'm very proud, actually, because part, being part of the commission, uh, that we managed, uh, accomplished this. And I th think it's really an important um, uh, product which we sort of created, um, both for teaching in medical contexts, but also, I think, for the wider community of Holocaust studies and uh, the wider society, actually. So, um, sorry. How does that work? Great. Yes. Um, Havik Czech has already given us uh, in the first part of the event a um, short overview of all the topics which we uh, addressed in the report. And uh, uh, these dealt with different parts or periods, the period up to 1933, the Nazi period in the narrow sense from 1933 to 45, and of course also the post-war period. And I won't go into details of these, uh, of the whole range of historical evidence, but want to focus uh, on the Nazi period itself from 33 to 45, and a few core insights within two spheres, the sphere of perpetrators and the sphere of victims. And also due to reasons of time, I won't go into the list of um, victim groups, for, for instance, or the activities. We have heard these on the side of the perpetrators, but immediately plunge into the first core insight if we look on the sphere of perpetrators. <clears throat> and I think one very, very important insight is that many basic post-war uh, assumptions and narratives about medicine during the Nazi period are in fact misconceptions or myths with the function of exoneration and to stabilize a kind of identity amongst professionals, medical professionals, which tried to move what happened in the past and very far away from what was present-day medicine in the post-war period. <clears throat> and I want just to introduce you to three of these basic myths or narratives. <clears throat> The first myth is medical atrocities were the result of irrational ideologies imposed from outside Nazi politicians on medicine, and in general, physicians themselves were forced to do what they did. This is a myth. The second stereotype narrative or myth is the programs of mass sterilization and systematic patient killings called euthanasia at that time, were the expression of an ideology that had little or nothing to do with contemporary state of art, medical reasoning and practice. And this is not true as well, if we look at the historical evidence, and I'll um, <clears throat> explain that in a minute. And the third myth refers to medical research. It says the activities of medical scientists experimenting on humans in concentration camps, psychiatric asylums, or, uh, or hospitals 
in the occupied territories had nothing to do with questions and methodical standards of contemporary biomedical sciences, but rather with the expression of racial ideology or even individual perversion disguised as science and therefore better termed pseudoscience. And this actually is also a myth. And I think this is highly irritating if these are all myths. <clears throat> so let me shortly show you the, some of the historical evidence which, you know, contrasts them with these myths. So the first myth was referring to the relation between politics, outside politics, implying pressure on principally innocent um, medicine and physicians. Um, so the historical evidence is that practically all atrocious activities in medical contexts, like ideas on race differences, forced sterilization, so-called euthanasia, forced human subject research, were initiated by physicians, not by politicians or by political instances. One example, a very small example, for the fact that physicians decided to do things, they have the responsibility, is the membership in the party. Only, that's still very much, but only 55 or 60 percent of physicians were members of the Nazi party. So this shows they were not forced to join the party, because then you had 99 or 100 percent membership, but they decided to become members. Yeah, that's one, just one small example. We have listed many more in the report. Another point is most medical atrocities were based on ideas, patterns of practice, and also value hierarchies, which may also be identified before 1933, after 1945, and outside of Germany in the, in the international medical community, <coughs> which contributed to the atrocities. So they built on these kind of patterns of practice and value hierarchies. And this, they were not, not specific for the Nazi period. And the third point here is that amongst the numerous physicians involved, there was a considerable number of professors from university medical schools, representatives of medical associations, and of high profile research organizations with international reputation, like the Kaiser Wilhelm Society at that time, today called Max Planck Society. So this shows that these perpetrators in the field of medicine, they were not isolated, fanatic psychopaths, but they were clever, intelligent, well-educated physicians, scientists, very well networked, sort of working in networks, and in very high represent uh, positions of um, professional um, institutions. <coughs> and many of them, as we already heard, had their high-profile post-war careers. So looking at the second myth, we see that, uh, which refers to the sterilization law and the mass killing of patients and handicapped people. And the historical evidence is that the Nazi law enabling forced sterilization, it was the radical implementation of programs of eugenics or racial hygiene, a term not coined by the Nazis, programs of eugenics or racial hygiene, which had been formulated and propagated by physicians and biologists, not by Himmler, Hitler, or any politicians. Uh, and this, we have already heard that, this was an international movement which originated in the 19th century. The term eugenics itself was coined by Francis Galton, British statistician, and the uh, term racial hygiene was coined by Alfred Plötz, a German physician in 1895. Around 1930, and internationally, there existed numerous eugenic associations, eugenic research institutes, for instance, Cold Spring Harbor, and in eugenically motivated sterilization laws in more than 20 states in the United States, in three Canadian provinces, and also in Denmark. And the idea that it, terminating life unworthy of living was justified it did not originate from Nazi brains, but it was propagated by physicians and lawyers in Germany, in the US, and in the UK since the beginning of the 20th century, it's not specific for the Nazi period. So I think this is highly irritating to see that. <coughs> and the third myth, referring to 
forced human subject research. Here we have to say that the research activities in the concentration camps, also in psychiatric asylums and hospitals in the occupied territories, were in part initiated and organized by internationally renowned biomedical scientists. And I've um, mentioned a few names here. In many cases, the research questions followed the state-of-the-art knowledge in medicine. They were perceived as pressing in the context of racial policies and war, so that is the context in which they were perceived as pressing, political contexts. And similarly, the methods applied to answer these questions, they were not outdated or absurd, but they were rational and coherent. So that's not the problem, that the questions were sort of irrational, or the methods were obsolete or nonsense, but the problem is here that the research practices were reckless, frequently brutal, and in parts deadly. So this shows that morality and ethics of research is, cannot be justified by justification of the high quality or high level of research questions or methods, but we have to look at the practice of research. That's the lesson, if, in a way. <clears throat> well, this was what I wanted to say in a nutshell about some insights of the report uh, on re looking at the sphere of the perpetrators. If we look at the sphere of the victims, physicians in this case, in the ghettos and the camps, first of all, we see a context of massive pressure, violence and threat of death. Still, we see that physicians continued to serve patients as far as they could. They created structures for medical teaching. For instance, in the Warsaw Ghetto, they sort of grew something like a medical school. They carried out research on conditions related to living in the ghetto. There's a very famous hunger disease study, which was indeed published in the post-war period as scientific sort of work not as a historical work. The physicians documented atrocities, and we have heard one example, Lucy Adelsberger, uh, earlier on. They documented these atrocities. I think this was important for themselves, but it was also important to prepare post-war trials. Some of the physicians, and this is a very interesting and tricky point, were forced to cooperate with the SS administration of the camps, or with perpetrator physicians. And we can see that physicians, mainly Jewish physicians, not all of them, attempted to subvert perpetrator activities and or to use limited resources they had to support co-prisoners. So even in these very, very severe contexts, there was a scope of action and there are responsibilities. Not everything can be explained by force, outside force. And I've mentioned two names here, that of Maximilian Samuel and Ludwig Fleck. Our colleague in the um, commission, historian Sari Siegel, has coined the concept of coercion resistance spectrum of individual physicians. And I think it's a very, very important concept to see how in shifting situations where physicians have to act, the contexts sort of looking at the context and looking for the scope of action you have is very important and imperative to, to probe uh, the scope of action and then act um, responsible. And not just, you know, say, well, I'm resignating, no choice. So that's more or less uh, what I wanted to say in a nutshell. And Summarizing this, the behavior of physicians during the Nazi period and the Holocaust illustrates, on the one side, if we look at the perpetrators, extreme forms of opportunism and abuse of power, although a scope of action existed. So we cannot explain what happened there simply by pressure force from outside, and it is completely inappropriate to explain medicine during the Nazi period and the Holocaust simply as a result of outside pressure and use that in present day debates to say politics should be kept outside of medicine. Yeah, that's this, I think is a grave example of abuse of history.
And if we look at the physicians act, as victims, we see the potentials and conditions of resistance and resilience in the face of threats, force, and inhumanity. And I think these are really profound starting points for further reflections on the implications for medicine today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Volker Rölke. We are now turning directly to the respondent, the respondent on this uh, panel, Professor Alec um, Natalia Alexion. Sorry, I'm <laughs> I know her very well, and I should be able to say I'm the name backwards and forwards. I'm not sure myself. But uh, this time it failed me. Uh, Natalia Alexion is the Harry Rich Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Florida, Gainesville. She has written extensively on the history of Polish Jews before, during, and after the Holocaust. And in particular, she's interested in Jewish medical students, Jewish physicians, and Jewish medical discourses in East Central Europe. Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for this introduction. Thank you for having me in this uh, incredibly beautiful space and at this a uh, truly um, joyous moment of celebrating uh, this uh, report. And uh, I must say I received it from Sabina um, a few weeks ago with a big, you know, do not circulate uh, note in the email. And this was so difficult because I'm teaching, <laughs> I'm teaching a class on the history of medicine uh, uh, this semester. And I just wanted to just do forward and look the other way uh, to, uh, to all my students. So I'm so happy that I will be able to do it now without um, tragic consequences. Uh, and uh, my beautiful PowerPoint is inside my computer, which is somewhere um, at the airport uh, in Vienna. Uh, I hope to be reunited with it tomorrow. So you'll be uh, spared a few, um, a few PowerPoints to look at. And let me just follow up on this um, wonderful and, and, and nuanced presentation and offer you really something that Dan Michman invited us to, meaning engage with this report, uh, engage in a conversation, engage in a dialogue. And um, um, I am a historian, a social historian, a historian of Eastern Europe and Jews, and this is the lens through which I primarily read this report, but I also thought that this is a remarkable piece, very much along the lines, again, uh, of uh, Dan's observation, that it's a wonderful piece of scholarship to be read not only in the context of medical training, and I know this was your goal, but in the context of education, higher education in general, because it brings together in a very not flat way, uh, again, a huge amount of knowledge that has been collected, has research that has been done by scholars in many countries, in many languages, in fact, and makes it accessible while continuing to ask questions or sort of forcing us to keep asking questions. It doesn't really offer all the answers. And so let me just say a few things, a few compliments, what I liked in particular, and then add to that camel, uh, you know, another layer sort of a wishful thinking of what, what I would love to see pushing further, again, as a, as a historian. So one aspect of, um, of this text that I find particularly impressive is that it manages to balance between a historical narrative, a complex historical narrative, and uh, biographical stories. In those panels, we uh, get to meet um, physicians, scholars, uh, perpetrators, Nazis, uh, victims, victims of the Holocaust. And so um, both perpetrators and, and uh, Nazi physicians, uh, Nazi physicians and victims uh, get humanized. Uh, and I think that both ways of humanization, both 
directions of humanization are, are very important. I agree very much what Falker was saying before, to see um, remarkable physicians, remarkable scholars who went to the best medical schools and uh, belonged to prestigious uh, institutions and, and, and organizations. And what I, uh, what I would like to actually, I'm changing my order, let me say what I would love to uh, think of more uh, is how these uh, two groups from those two spheres, how they met really in those medical schools, possibly in those organizations, in conversations, at conferences, and what does it mean for the emergence of medical atrocities uh, during the Holocaust. What I also very much like about this report is that it has this long chronological perspective, that it touches on the ideas and practices uh, and biographies that existed before the Holocaust and that came to play a role and individuals that came to play a role during the, during the Holocaust, during the war, had lives during that period and then it peaks into the post-war in uh, very interesting ways, sometimes explicitly, sometimes not explicitly, for example, by showing us that some perpetrators of medical crimes had long, uh, long uh, as distinguished uh, careers. And again, something to think about, I think also for students that will be looking at this report. It also shows those immensely medical lives, uh, lives that are infused with medical uh, training and medical practice. And I was thinking just before I was coming to Vienna about one such example on the side of uh, Jewish, um, uh, Jewish physicians, Ludwig Landau, who happened to be the father of Ida Fink, distinguished uh, Polish language survivor, uh, Israeli writer, um, who pr uh, learned in Vienna, completed me medical training in Vienna shortly after World War I. I think he wanted to stay. He started his internship here, and then in early 20s returned to his hometown in what is now uh, Western Ukraine in Zbaraj. And he had long 20 years of being the uh, town doctor, um, beloved, um, a beloved physician, then he was actually um, helped by both Ukrainian and Polish uh, former patients who protected him and his two daughters, including Ida Fink, organizing false papers for his daughters and finding hiding places for him. But he also, something that is mentioned in the, uh, in the report and what Volker mentioned in his presentation, but he was also faced with difficult choices uh, while practicing medicine, while trying to help uh, Jews in the ghetto, and actually also seeing non-Jewish patients. Um, he was forced to participate in medical uh, evaluations of people before deportations to what turned out to be deportations to Belzec, and he um, speaks about all this in his, uh, in his long interview. And then he practiced medicine in Poland in the newly acquired former Niederschlesian um, territories, and then he went to Israel where he practiced medicine in Holon. So he had, you have this long medical life uh, in multiple languages, in multiple countries, uh, but for which the Holocaust remains, remains a crucial, crucial time. Uh, what I also think this uh, report is remarkable for is the synthesis of many lenses, many fields. There is the legal lens, there is the cultural lens, there is the history of ideas lens, there is a touch of gender, um, and of course this history of medicine uh, and of medical uh, um, practice. Um, it's also showing the emergence of Nazi medicine and Nazi medical practitioners as a process, not something that had to happen. It's very clear uh, how various uh, legal changes and various choices that you talked about are being made. And while it focuses on Germany, 
um, it tries to also have an open geographic scope as Holocaust is a European project. And so we look at uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, we look at regional uh, trajectories and individual, uh, individual lives. I'm, of course, especially uh, happy that um, this is not only a report on medical atrocities, medical crimes, medical experiments uh, carried out by um, physicians who were willing to um, um, chose and were willing to collaborate and be part of these projects, but this is also a report that tries to explain uh, Jewish physicians, Jewish medical networks, Jewish institutions uh, of uh, medicine and public health, and does it with, again, a great deal of nuance and, and complexity. And I hope that students that will get to read this report will want to know more, not only about Mengele, uh, but also about Ludwig Fleck and uh, Anna Braude Heller. And of course, you didn't have 17 volumes to fill, so, uh, and while this is a very impressive camel, uh, you know, you only had one. Uh, but let me, let me just mention a few, a few things that I was, um, I remained asking myself, and I was very happy that it actually made me think of questions because they were not clearly resolved on the pages of this, um, of this report. So one, uh, I would love to know more about Nazification of the uh, medical training. It's a great subchapter, but it, it, and I actually never thought about it before I read it, but then I wanted a whole volume about it. Uh, and, uh, and since we have these pre-existing ideas and practices, so what exactly happens? Uh, how exactly does it change the kind of producing uh, knowledge and, uh, and uh, producing practices uh, uh, of, of Nazi um, uh, physicians, quote unquote. Uh, I'm also very puzzled by stories of relationships between physicians and patients. And in some ways patients are the least present, but they are in the background, right? Some physicians we learn were beloved and uh, popular. Yes, yes, I'm coming to an end. I only have two more questions. Uh, so I would love to know more. Uh, and, and again, something that starts, I think, a conversation. Um, and then I was curious about physicians that are there, especially if you go beyond a uh, Third Reich, uh, who are not German or Austrian physicians and not Jewish physicians. Um, I don't know if there's a category of bystander physicians, but, you know, Polish phys physicians, French physicians. Uh, what happens with these uh, medical networks, personal networks, connections that predate um, war, occupation, uh, and the Holocaust. Uh, but I think this is a fantastic beginning of an important conversation, and um, I will be forwarding it to my students <laughs> promptly. Thank you very much. Dear Professor Lexion, many thanks uh, for this engaging talk, engaging also in the sense, of course, that uh, it's, it's clearly visible that you're deeply engaged with uh, what we wrote. And uh, yeah, I fully agree that this is an ongoing conversation. Maybe even immediately for the coffee break, we'll be uh, breaking for about 10 minutes. We have to shorten it a little bit. We are uh, running slightly behind time, behind our plan. Um, so please be mindful uh, of the time. We will reconvene shortly in 10 minutes. See you soon.
Okay, we're moving on in our program. Professor Hedy Wald. <laughs> Okay, we're moving on with our program swiftly to our panel two, where we talk once again about implications from history for today. We're getting more specific now, and we'll hear from Professor Matt Winia, who is the director of the University of Colorado's Center for Bioethics and Humanities. He's an internist specializing in infectious diseases, public health, and bioethics, with a focus on understanding the complex legacies of health professional involvement in the Holocaust. His center in Colorado runs uh, the Holocaust Genocide Contemporary Bioethics Program, which is at the forefront of efforts to ensure all health professional students, trainees, and practitioners to have uh, meaningful opportunities to learn about and reflect upon this history. He's a member of this commission. Thank you very much, Matt. Um. No one else has said this yet, surprisingly, but uh, William Faulkner said, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And I think that's the, that's the theme that runs through these talks, that this past is not dead. Um, it's with us today in ways that we recognize and sometimes in ways that we don't recognize or that we actively suppress. Um, so my task today was uh, to talk about um, implications, and I think there's a, there's a tendency when you think about implications to think about sort of lessons learned. Uh, what, what have we taken from this history? How are we using this history today? What are its implications when we think about contemporary issues? Um, and I think uh, Volker really opened this up for me. Um, did I just do that? Well, um, Volker really opened this up for me. Th there are implications for this history that are frankly wrong. There are implications of this history that we have suppressed. There are implications of this history that are implicit but not explicit. And so I wanted to turn that question on its head and talk today about lessons unlearned. What haven't we been able to learn despite this history? Um, I think, sadly, it's a timely uh, way to think about this history. Um, we made, I think, a quite good argument in the Commission's report, and you've heard others make these points, so I won't belabor them, about why this history should be important. Um, understanding of this complex and nuanced history can help us understand how we got to where we are today. Why do we have the ethical standards that we do? Why do we have the regulations that we do? Um, it can give us a view of sort of what's the underlying foundations of contemporary bioethics. And if you understand well how things change over time, why was Hitler such a powerful transformational leader? This is a lesson in how change takes place. It's a lesson in the fragility um, of our ethics, of our need to protect it, but also it's a lesson in re-examining our ethics on a continuing basis. And the, that sort of a combination, which we talk about some in the report, the combination of humility and courage is, uh, is really something that we struggle and strive to instill in health professions trainees. Um, the commission said learning about and reflecting upon this history supports the formation of morally courageous and resilient professionals equipped to confront current and future ethical challenges. So we think the implications of learning this history are that you can, that you can uh, take what you learn from this history and use it to build your sense of moral courage, that you will understand how society affects the way that we think in medicine and therefore have a better critical eye to recognize the hidden curriculum, right? The stuff that you're being taught, not explicitly, but just this is the way we do things around here, medical culture, um, that we can use this history to help students learn to become change agents, that they will see the aspects of medicine that we've got wrong, as well as those that need to be protected. 
Um, and we make this wonderful, I think, wonderful analogy um, in the report that history is to the culture of healthcare as basic science is to the practice of healthcare, which is to say, you can become a pretty good practitioner just by learning how practice goes right now and never change anything. But if you want to understand how to improve practice, you need to understand the basic science. If you want to just be part of the medical culture, you just need to become part of the medical culture, traditional identity formation around what it means to be a doctor. If you want to be a change agent within the culture, you need to understand how we came to have the culture that we have today. You need to understand the history. Um, there are a half a dozen really obvious lessons from this history that we have failed to learn or that it took us decades to learn or that we got wrong. How does that happen, right? We walk out of the Nuremberg medical trial with a set of principles for ethical research, which by the way, we claim at the time are so obvious and so well accepted that they never even had to be written down before. The only reason we didn't have these written down is because everyone was already doing all these things. And 25 years later is the revelation of the Tuskegee syphilis study. 20 years later is the revelation, 23 years later, is the revelation of the Willowbrook study. As I listened to Shani's grandmother talking, I could not help but think of the Willowbrook study where, uh, if you're not familiar with this, children, children with disabilities are intentionally infected with hepatitis between 1950s and 1970s. Uh, they're living in an institutional setting and you know what the rationale is? The rationale is they're all gonna eventually get hepatitis anyways. So it's okay to intentionally infect children with hepatitis. Was the public outcry about that in part influenced by the history of knowledge of the Holocaust? Maybe, but knowledge of the history of the Holocaust did not affect the medical researchers planning that study in the 1950s, right after the Holocaust, right after the Nuremberg medical trial. So why is it so hard to learn these, you know, discrimination against people with disabilities in healthcare. I, I have a, a colleague in my center, Eric Campbell, who's done work with Lisa Iazzoni in the last three years, surveying, national survey of doctors. 82% of doctors in the United States think that most people with disabilities have a bad quality of life. 82%. And only 40% think that they can provide quality medical care to a person with disabilities. These are not distant history. This is contemporary data. How does that continue on after this history? Um, I, I won't mention the others for the sake of time, but just to say, you know, each of these are different. The reason why um, ongoing discrimination against people with disabilities persists is probably different than the reasons why um, we failed to learn lessons about research ethics from the Nazi doctors. They're probably different, but there are some underlying, I think, common themes about why it's been challenged, uh, challenging for us to learn from the history of the Nazis. Um, I'll start with the most obvious one. It's really hard to learn lessons if the material is not taught. So, you know, we have to teach about this history or, or we will not learn lessons from it, right? If this history is suppressed, if it's not discussed, if we, you know, and the, again, these are data from a survey that we did. Uh, these are getting to be old data now. I'd love to redo this survey, by the way, if anyone knows folks at AAMC. Um, we had a 100% response rate on this survey and only 16% of all medical schools in the US and Canada had any required, not a single lecture was enough to say yes to this question, only 16%. So the vast majority of schools don't even touch this. Um, also, 
There are other reasons. Um, this is uh, from a piece that came out a couple of years ago, but I think uh, I would guess most members of the commission would agree with this. This is a, a unique history. It is a painful history. It's an embarrassing history. It's not just German history, right? The eugenic um, sterilization program was in part inspired by eugenic sterilization programs in my own country, in the United States. Harry Laughlin had a model law that was implemented in California and pretty much transcribed into German to be used as the Germans' forcible sterilization law. So th this is an embarrassing history for all of us. Um, and effective teaching of it requires not just knowledge of the history, it requires sensitivity to some important pitfalls. Um, I'll start with the fact that um, a lot of health science students didn't take a whole bunch of history courses in their undergraduate curriculum. And if this is the first time they've ever heard about these things, uh, you know, people cry when they hear this history. This is, it can be, it can actually be damaging. Um, so approaching this history with sensitivity is important. Any kind of comparison between then and now is very liable to backfire. It's a rare person whom you say, you know, you're behaving a little like a Nazi. And they say, oh, you're right. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Instead, what they say is, what the? I'm not, you're the one being a Nazi, right? So making comparisons between anything someone is doing today and anything that happened then is incredibly uh, perilous. This is the idea of a Nazi card, right? It's very likely to shut down learning rather than opening up learning. Um, that all said, it may not be easy but learning about and reflecting upon these ethical transgressions. And I'm gonna just uh, close with this. I had, the, I had planned to read this quote, but um, like all of you, I guess, I got to see the student's um, essay today. I hadn't seen this before. So instead of reading the quote that I took from our report, I'm gonna quote the last uh, paragraph of the student's section. Learning about medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust is crucial for all healthcare learners to help shape moral beliefs and behaviors, develop professional identities informed by this history. Understanding this history facilitates what they call a cascade of impacts. Remembering and respecting victims and vulnerable populations, increasing awareness of our capacity to harm, better facility and ethical reflection, and the hope that we can prevent future atrocities through understanding our responsibilities as regards human rights and acknowledging the ethical dimensions of all healthcare practice. I, I wanna end with the students because I gotta say, um, putting together these thoughts on what we fail to learn and how difficult it is to learn from this history could be depressing, except for reading that essay by the students. Um, that is what gives me hope. Thank you so much, uh, Matt Venia. Our next speaker is Professor Petra Fuchs. She is a Professor Emerita of Higher Pedagogic Inclusion Studies at the University of Applied Sciences in Zittau Görlitz. And as an ed educational scientist and historian, her research focuses is on uh, history of medicine and disability history. She has worked on major projects on the history of Nazi so-called euthanasia and the memorialization of its victims, which were funded by the German Research Foundation. She serves as co-editor of the Journal of Disability Studies. Professor Fuchs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and for the possibility to talk to you today. And I think uh, it fits very much together <laughs> what we both have to say. <laughs> um, in view of current national and global developments, a deeply disturbing, intensifying anti-Semitism, the scarcity of resources, national and international tendencies towards demarcation and exclusion in economic terms and in the context of migration, 
as well as the fundamental threat to democracy, the significance of the Lancet report, Medicine, Nazism and the Holocaust is in my view abundantly clear. It makes a significant uh, contribution to the humanization and democratization of world societies by acquiring, modifying and imparting scientific historical knowledge and imparting humanistic human rights values as well as the ability to form appropriate moral value judgments and to align one's own behavior accordingly. In particular, I consider the combination of cognitive and effective learning in the examination of medicine under national socialism to be expedient in order to identify and counteract the tendency of uh, dehumanized medicine in the present. I can only agree with the goal of enabling the development of a historically informed professional identity, the basis of which is empathy towards the human counterpart. Because in a view of my own lifelong traumatization through the medical, therapeutic and nursing treatment that I experienced at the end of the 1950s, I often look with fear at my own increasing vulnerability and the increasing dependence on other people in old age and to the end of my life at some point. However, when it comes to topic of disability, reading the Lancet report has triggered a number of questions in me. Therefore, I, I would like to take the op opportunity to present and share with you a few of my thoughts in this context under the heading Aftermath of Nazi Euthanasia and Implications for Today from the Perspective of Disability. What is the aftermath of Nazi Euthanasia on disabled people? After the end of the Nazi dictatorship, psychiatric institutions were largely emptied as research on Nazi euthanasia puts it. After 1945, the large facilities, some of which had up to 3,000 beds, often housed only a few hundred patients. Thus, the goal of the Nazi racial ideology to create a society without the members described as inferior and unworthy of life had been approximately realized. Only a few survivors of the asylum murders spoke out as contempor te contemporary witnesses in the immediate post-war period. And with very few exceptions, they were neither heard in public trials nor asked for, or, for written or oral presentations afterwards. This is a, a quote. Among the contemporary witnesses who years later have made an impressive and lasting statement about the Nazi injustice suffered and its lifelong consequences are, for example, Dorothea Buck, Paul Brune, Elvira Mantai, Ne Hempel, and Clara Novak, the <coughs> co-founder and longtime supervisor of the Association of Euthanasia Victims and Forced Sterilization. There were also survivors of the Nazi era among the activi activists of the disability movement, which began to develop in West Germany in the 1960s. Nobody knows about that. <laughs> in contrast to the majority of the German population, they and their comrades in arms born after the end of the war were aware of the medical crimes against disabled people. And they were of central importance for the personal and political struggle of disabled activists against paternalism, discrimination and social injustice. Like other groups of actors, the disability movement has been involved in the politics of remembrance from the very beginning and has made a significant contribution to the reappraisal of racial hygiene. 
uh, Nazi eugenics and euthanasia with its own research, scientific publications and numerous other activities. A central motive for this commitment was the perception that disabled people were ignored in the slow process of coming to terms with the Nazi past in the late 1970s and that their history, the history of the extermination of life, unworthy of life, as well as that of Nazi forced sterilization had yet to be written. Added to this was the fact that until the 1980s, disabled people in direct personal contact were often referred to as life unworthy of life and confronted with statements such as under Hitler, you would have been gassed. With the simultaneous establishment of human genetic counseling, the beginnings of prenatal diagnostics and the emerging new social debate about euthanasia Sterbehilfe in Germany, um, a constant feeling of potential threat to life uh, came up in people with disabilities. They feared, and I think they still fear it, that the Nazi crimes against disabled people would be repeated, that disabled people could once again become victims of society's desire to kill and an ideologically motivated will to exterminate. Against this background, the activists' research interest focused on the question on the connections between national socialism and contemporary society and led to the examination of genetic engineering and the respective bioethical discourse. One concrete, critical and pioneering aftermath of Nazi euthanasia is represented by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in which disabled people worldwide played a major role. A number of disability-related human rights are also based on the human rights violations of the Nazi era. Article 10 guarantees the inherent right to life of every human being. Article 15 provides for protection against involuntary forced medical or scientific experiments. Article 17 enshrines the right to respect for individual physical and mental integrity, and Articles 23 and 25 ensure the right of disabled persons to non-discriminatory access to partnership, parenthood, and marriage, as well as to sexual and reproductive health services. What are the implications for today from the perspective of disability for the topic medicine, Nazism and the Holocaust? When we talk about NS euthanasia today, we need to be more specific about the groups of victims who have been murdered in connection with this medical crime. Among the asylum residents who were killed in the six euthanasia institutions in 1940-41 as part of Action T4 uh, were mainly people with psychiatric diseases as well as with physically, sensory and cognitive disabilities. In the beginning of the gas murders, the Jewish patients were selected in a so-called special operation the murder of more than 400, 400 Jewish psychiatric patients from Berlin and the province of Brandenburg in July 1940 in the gas chamber of the Brandenburg Killing Center is the first mass murder of Jews in the German Reich and marks the beginning of the Holocaust. In addition to the criterion race, the patients admitted to psychiatric institutions were subjected to further grouping and hierarchization processes. Sorry. Among the disabled persons, a constructed and only seemingly homogeneous social group, the majority of them were children and adults with cognitive impairments. These patients were among the main victims under the label of disability, 
provided that they were among the incurable, incapable of work and education, disruptive and highly dependent on care. It is difficult or source-related impossible to differentiate all these groups of victims according to their respective numbers or in their numerical relation to each other. Nevertheless, as race, the differential category of disability is of critical importance in the context of the destruction of life unworthy of life, but it is not yet reflected. As a result, opportunities for cognitive cognition and effective awareness raising among health professionals remain untapped, which support the concern to raise awareness of the Holocaust and the Nazi medical crimes against mentally ill, mentally disabled, and socially undesirable people in medicine and to promote the development of a professional identity informed by history. If we want to form enlightened change agents who are able to stand up against racism, anti-Semitism and, quote, other forms of discrimination, then it is essential to acquire knowledge about the different manifestations of discrimination. In the context of the category of disability, the term ableism refers to a specific form of discrimination in which disabled people are exposed to prejudice, disadvantages and reservations. It involves the assumption that disabled people have less value or fewer abilities than non-disabled people. Campbell defines ableism as a network of beliefs processes and practices uh, that produce a specific standardized self-image and body image that is portrayed as essentially and fully human. In this way, disability becomes a state of inferior humanity or it is, as the phrase, life unworthy of life already suggests, the human condition is completely denied. Cognitive and other disabled victims of Nazi euthanasia were considered unfit for education of work, racially or genetically inferior, and useless from the point of view of utility in terms of work and society. This is only one theoretical setting of the inter- and transdisciplinary disability studies, which have also established themselves in the, new, uh, in the German-speaking world since the beginning of 2000. In my view, disability studies and the research field of disability history offer previously unnoticed potential for the teaching the topic of medicine, national socialism and the Holocaust especially against the background of the current encroaching, violent, terrorist and exclusionary handling of difference, which can be observed worldwide, the investigation of the historical development of these practices and the thought patterns and structures on which they are based is of immense, even existential importance. It is only through the acquisition of historical knowledge that current social processes and challenges can be understood in their complexity. But above all, they can also be examined in order, I quote, possibly develop orientation knowledge that enables other ways of dealing with things. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Fuchs, for this enlightening presentation that really widens our view to what we're trying to do here. Um, I would like to hand over now to my dear colleague and co-chair, Shmuel Rice, who will chair the next panel. Thank you, Sabine, my dear colleague and co-chair. Uh, 
this session is the only thing between you and your dinner, so I know it's a, it's a challenge, but I think it's going to be uh, very stimulating. Uh, as you can see, we have three speakers, all of them uh, highly qualified. Uh, there is one thing, two things I want to say before we uh, start. Next slide, please. Oh, no, it doesn't work this way. Yes. Uh, as the commission was uh, doing its work, and especially in the last years, there have been already significant educational developments, which I think is a uh, validation of the work of the commission, which was not expected to produce already educational changes. But these have happened, and I think it's important to mention them. Uh, first, and this dates back to uh, Esteban and Rosa's work of 20 years, more or less, of, and then Hedy uh, in the last two years, and also Mike with a virtual visit, the whole uh, pedagogy of going to sites and visits, sometimes with reflective work, is, is uh, made the giant strides. The second, and you, uh, tomorrow, Matt, as the uh, course director, we are launching the first faculty development for potential teachers of Holocaust and medicine with uh, 14 or 15 fellows, many of them here with us, and uh, seven or eight commissioners that will serve as the teachers, and it's another uh, small miracle. And uh, there is a course that you will hear about from Emma in a second, uh, of, of a, a online course for the African context, for modules in an online um, format, and I think it's uh, extremely um, validating and, and exciting that this is the first product of the Students Advisory Council that is already uh, going to happen uh, before the end of this year. Uh, there is the MOOC that those who are in the commission know about it, and I'll give you a flavor of it in a second. Uh, Michal Ramot, my co-course uh, uh, director for this, is here with us, and uh, next year it will be available for the world. And uh, another small miracle is that in the report we actually summarize an assessment approach to how to evaluate educational interventions, and it's going to be applied as of tomorrow morning on the faculty development, development course. And it's such a complex assessment package that it's really a, a dream come true that it's going to start tomorrow. So just in order, before I hand over uh, to the speakers, can you press the bottom link? This will give you a, a one minute flavor of the MOOC. I was just following orders is a phrase that has become synonymous with Europeans who are complicit in the genocide of millions during the Holocaust. The literature suggests that physicians may have been especially vulnerable to this problem with authority since the medical profession also has a culture of conformity and deference to hierarchy. The med students do what their residents tell them to do, the junior residents take instructions from the senior residents, and all the trainees listen to their staff physician. That's the structure we're trained in, so that's the culture that pervades our profession. We as doctors also have an enormous amount of hierarchical power over our patients, with an inherent power differential with us as the gatekeepers to investigations and treatment. One minute, we don't have time, just a taste. Um, the first speaker is going to be Hedy Wald, Professor Hedy Wald. She's a clinical professor of family medicine at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University. She is faculty at Harvard Medical School Pediatrics Leadership. She is an adjunct professor in Oakland University School of Medicine. Uh, professor Wald's uh, research focuses 
on Holocaust and Medicine Education, Interactive Reflective Writing, uh, Enhanced Reflection Supporting Professional Identity Formation, and Promoting Resilience and Flourishing. She serves as co-director and advisor to many academic programs in this domain and is a member of the commission. Hedy, please. Oh, here you are. Right. Where do I advance the slide? What? This, right here. You have a PowerPoint? Yeah. So they should, here it is, okay. and you push this one. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be here with you today. And I will be discussing the aspect of the report of teaching for tomorrow. Um, as you may notice, some of my bio that I like to call the hidden CV is placed on my first slide along with my credentials um, because I've received some very positive feedback about doing so. I'm speaking today in memory of my father, Moses Vlasky, Morris Wald, and the Vlasky and Ruchik families that were murdered in Auschwitz and Treblinka I speak with students about this photo of my father with the number on his arm, hugging his autistic grandson, and how both of them were destined to death in large part due to Nazi doctors. I'm also speaking today in memory of my beloved husband, Dr. Mark Weiner, who honored and loved my work. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank our co-chairs for realizing this wonderful achievement and my deepest thanks to Professor Richard Horton and Marianne Sabin, who helped us realize this special day. So, here we are in teaching for tomorrow, and within this, the objectives of the report are to evaluate the existing medical curricula and propose educational approaches that promote ethical conduct, compassionate identity formation, and moral development. So what we wish to do is to take us from evidence-based historical knowledge to tomorrow. What is the practical application in clinical contexts, in medical research, and health policies, and for our global citizenship? How do we operationalize our key messages? So the report contextualizes the history as a powerful platform to support morally resilient professional identity formation, which is an active, dynamic, transformative process, fundamental for professionalism. We are bringing a scholarly approach with core themes that include reflection, relationship in mentoring and patient care, and resilience, which includes moral resilience, as noted in this academic medicine commentary. Core values, moral principles, and self-awareness are relevant to all health professions education, such as nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, and I love this topic, including self-authorship, of, of agency, of having some active agency here which needs our emphasis. So in essence, our report is supporting, refining here a definition of reflection for the being as well as doing the work of a physician, and this is an article I had written in Medical Teacher about this. It is a mix of reflective practice and historical awareness for history-informed ethical professional identity formation that will be explicit in curriculum. We describe in the report how international curricula for health professions, including in undergraduate, graduate, and continuing medical education might be seminars, a post-seminar reflection session, a semester elective, modules, a longitudinal thread that goes through the curriculum, and required curriculum, which we call for in our report, and also, as Professor Rice mentioned, study trips. Key curricular elements include Skilled facilitation of critical reflection on evidence-based history and the personal and professional implications. What does this mean to me? The global relevance, the local relevance. Contemporary relevance, we term in echoes, with the proper use of the Holocaust analogy. 
use of integrative health humanities. And this is very exciting because we see this now with more emphasis on the humanities in medical education. And you are nodding your head because you did your doctorate in that, Jane. History of medicine, art interpretation, reflective writing, narratives, and there is literature now coming out, with a, even a new article by Professor Steiner, and how this allies with cultivating core competencies. Use of testimonials and narratives, study trips, which is power of the place that students describe as life changing, history informed professional identity formation, as I mentioned, and this is mapped to what we heard about the informative, formative, and transformative learning outcomes. These are user friendly, they are state of the art, and they are in the report. As this billboard says from a college, there is no moral compass app. We must take the time, there are no shortcuts, to teach and learn history-informed professional identity formation. So we move from theory to practice, and we have a rich appendix in the report, which I hope that you will take some time to look at, that includes 18 successfully implemented curricular exemplars. Some are required modules or course, such as the Ben-Gurion Medical School in Israel. Um, our colleague has a required course, uh, Professor Mati Fox, um, who can't be with us today, but it's wonderful that it's required. We had a required social justice module at the Texas Tech Medical School, where we integrated an hour on Henrietta Lacks and some of the research ethics issues, along with a seminar on Holocaust in medicine. A required course at the University of Toronto. Others are elective and may include a study trip. As you can see here, some, all of these are included in the report. Giesen University, um, some of the study trips we're doing, uh, Oakland University, um, Beaumont School of Medicine, uh, T4, virtual excursion. Um, just go down the list here, Na a national presentation for the AAMC in America, uh, the course that's happening in Spain. Um, it, it's just very, very exciting to see this. And these are curriculum exemplars that our readers can work with and be in touch on and use. My colleague from Germany, Dr. Dieter Tauschel, said to me, we can't separate intellect from the heart and spirit. And I really believe that, and it comes through in these curriculars. Poetry is a modality for bringing intentional presence, fostering reflection, and using historical narrative. Dr. Janusz Korsak, was a Polish Jewish pediatrician who accompanied Warsaw Ghetto Orphans to Treblinka and gave his life. I bring Naomi Raplansky's poem, Korsak and the Orphans, to support reflection. He made his choice. He went with them, their eyes so large, their ribs so plain. They walked, a thin and straggling line past beefy booted, grinning guards. In the bookkeeping of the butchers, how small an entry this would make. 192 children, 13 adults. And here are the memorials to Dr. Korsak at Yad Vashem in Israel and in Warsaw. And here, a beautiful first year medical student, Mayuri Kothrosha from Eastern Virginia Medical School, after a seminar on Holocaust and medicine, sent this beautiful painting. The painting represents the importance of unity in medicine. Amongst all the complexities around you, represented by the colorful swirls around the hands, it's essential to always show compassion to one another. So that there are these different modalities that we offer for deep reflection on this history. Place-based learning, power of the place, is integral to various curricular and refer to students as transformative. Here I am in Birkenau with Oakland University Beaumont medical students on an Auschwitz study trip. The power of place is described in our report and I am using personal narrative of my father's suffering there, and I am showing them what actually transpired at that very spot in Birkenau. After presenting at the Naharia Israel Holocaust and Medicine Conference, the son of the man at the top, where I have the blue arrow, approached me and said that was his father, Gutman Yehuda Bloomberg. And here are pictures of Gutman Yehuda Bloomberg in Israel, and I have subsequently discussed this with students with significant impact, because there is a power of narrative. 
Our commission report discusses how curricula include contemporary relevance or what can be termed as echoes of the Holocaust. This is a distillation of that very large list that Dr. <laughs> Professor uh, Hildebrand had shown us earlier. And you can see the areas that we are touching on as we move forward with this history in our curricula a potential abuse of power or beginning of land of life issues, do loyalties, conflicts of interest, it just goes on and on, informed consent. Is it true informed consent when it's a cancer clinical trial, for example? Diversity, equity, and inclusion curricula, are we really doing that, what we say we are doing? The challenge of genomics and technology expansion, health inequities, the conduct during wartime, societal anti-racism and anti-anti-Semitism efforts, moral clarity, speaking up as a global citizen, for example, when there's genocidal intent. Ellie Wiesel said, indifference for me is the epitome of evil. And so, we discuss in our report some of the inadequacies that are happening in the diversity, equity, inclusion programming because we don't see anti-Semitism mentioned. And we're currently seeing over 500% increase in volume of anti-Semitism around the world. We appeal to national medical education associations and accrediting bodies to address this striking omission. President Biden's recently released United States national strategy to counter anti-Semitism called for employers uh, even including institutions of higher education to review these DEI programs to ensure full inclusion of anti-Semitism awareness and training, as well as workplace religious accommodation requirements and best practices to prevent religious discrimination. Our curricula on legacy of medicine during Nazism and the Holocaust can play a fundamental role to ensure the inclusion of this vital topic. Assessment of impact is under-researched. In our report, we encourage further research in this domain, and we offer various measures to consider. We wrote that educators and researchers in the field testify that learning this history transforms. So let us work together to assess core knowledge, history-informed professional identity formation, reflective capacity, moral resilience, agency, courage, reasoning, and conduct. One of the tenets of the nursing lead profession's definition of professional identity formation is leadership. And Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of the UK said that leadership is the greatest privilege. Recent reported positive outcomes of curriculum implementation include Gonzalez Lopez and Cortez, they are with us today, finding increasing awareness of bioethical issues for Spanish medical students, finding meaning-making for personal and professional identity formation of medical and psychology students with my colleagues in Germany, Drs. Riesen, Kiesling, and Tauschel. It's gratifying to see that there was a key theme emerging in reflective writing of the intention to use learning for moral courage and responsibility. Here, in, from Israel, Oren Romem, and in the United States, Professor Cruz and myself for professional identity formation critical intellectual thinking in nursing programs. As we consider impact, our commission report discusses that further evidence is needed as well as further precision in design, pedagogy, assessment, and implementation in regard to formative and transformative learning. We have a responsibility as medical educators because the past of medicine is about the future of medicine. In Pierre K. Avot Ethics of the Fathers, it states, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. So I leave you with hope, and I leave you as we move from darkness to light. Praise song for the day, Elizabeth Alexander. In today's sharp sparkle, this winter air, anything can be made, any sentence begun, on the brink, on the brim, on the cusp, praise song for walking forward in that light. And we hope that effective curriculum implementation on medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust will support health professions learners at all stages of the professional life cycle to develop, in the words of Yitzhak Katzenelson, a Polish Jewish dramatist and poet murdered in Auschwitz in 1944, the wisdom to see, the courage to change, and the ability to act. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Hedy. Uh, next is Emma Nalianya, a general practitioner at Kenyatta University, teaching referral and research hospital in Nairobi, Kenya. She holds a postgraduate diploma in bioethics, human rights, and health law from the University of Porto, Portugal. Emma has created the first course on medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust for healthcare students and workers in Africa, which will launch in the coming weeks. She serves as a member of this commission's Student Advisory Council. Emma, please. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Emma Nalianya from Kenya, and uh, I'm a member of the Student Advisory Council of the Lancet Commission on Medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust. We are all gathered here today from the East, West, North, and South because what happened in Nazi-occupied Europe uh, about 90 years ago matters. And we can no longer remain uh, quiet about this history because we continue to uh, have echoes, uh, such as in uh, anti-Semitism, overt uh, racism, and uh, racism uh, embedded in um, concepts such as uh, white supremacy, white privilege, and uh, we also have uh, crimes against humanity that are still uh, ongoing. On the mid-morning of uh, August 19th, 2023, a mentally ill man was uh, dancing by the roadside and uh, a motorbike rider uh, commented that uh, in Swahili we say, Mimi Heri Waniwe, which is uh, I'd rather be killed. But uh, would he really prefer to be killed if he was the mentally challenged man? Probably not. So uh, uh, I couldn't stop uh, myself from thinking that uh, perhaps a similar thought process compounded by systemic factors and uh, corrupt moral agency contributed to the action T4 in uh, Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, the killing of uh, helpless and vulnerable people was uh, very disturbing, and uh, what was even more disturbing was that uh, this killing, uh, the policies that led to these killings were formulated, implemented, and uh, supported by healthcare professionals who had uh, taken an oath to first do no harm. It is such moral failures and uh, transgressions um, in the Nazi areas, in the Nazi era, uh, that informed the uh, current uh, bioethics, and uh, there is need for all healthcare professionals and learners across the world to learn about this history and uh, cultivate a moral agency and uh, uh, demonstrate uh, moral courage. Uh, the Lancet Commission on Medicine and the Holocaust, in its uh, efforts to uh, ensure that the historical evidence, implications for today, and uh, teachings for tomorrow are disseminated to uh, all uh, parts of the world, form, uh, formed a student uh, advisory council, of which uh, I was privileged to be a member of, and I got the opportunity to work with uh, 14 amazing colleagues uh, who are committed to achieving the objectives uh, of the commission. We also advise the Commission on uh, initiatives, progress, and share ideas on contemporary relevance to medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust. Additionally, we will also be disseminating the teachings and uh, the reports of this commission to our institutions, countries, and uh, even continent. Uh, as a member of the Student uh, Advisory Council, I got to uh, acquire in-depth knowledge in medicine, Nazism, and the Holocaust from uh, our amazing uh, commissioners and uh, from the uh, literature with act factual information that was uh, shared to us. Uh, I really like the concept of uh, learning through reflection, and um, I got uh, to exchange ideas with my brilliant uh, colleagues. Uh, together with uh, Hedy, Shmuel, and Sabine, we uh, started a course on uh, introduction to medicine during the Holocaust with the objective of introducing this domain to healthcare students and professionals uh, in the African context. And uh, the course is uh, composed of four modules. Each module has an uh, introduction followed by a narrated PowerPoint uh, a presentation from uh, the faculty. and. Um, we also have additional literature and video 
followed by a reflective session. Uh, before the course and after the course, there is a pre and a post survey and a test uh, to assess the knowledge and the attitude of the learners. So uh, the curriculum content has uh, an introduction and the first module is on medicine, Nazism and the Holo and, and Holocaust education for professional identity formation that is uh, taught to us by uh, Hedy. And uh, the second one is uh, history of medicine, Nazism and the Holocaust uh, by uh, Schmoll. Uh, the third is anatomy in Nazi Germany and its legacies for today by Sabine. And finally, implications of medicine, Nazism and the Holocaust education in the African context by Schmuel again. So we got literature that was uh, carefully selected for this audience and uh, we believe that uh, uh, for first time learners, this is, uh, will be very instrumental. Uh, for module one, we have uh, Deadly Medicine uh, by Hedy and uh, her daughter, Chana. Then uh, for module two, we have uh, Holker's uh, interview of 2022, uh, followed by public health uh, in the Vilna ghetto and uh, Windling's uh, dangers of uh, white supremacy. For module three, we have uh, books, Bones and Bodies by Sabine and uh, uh, the last module, uh, the Holocaust, Medicine, and Becoming a Physician by Shmuel, Hedy, and uh, Weindling. So by the end of this course, we expect that uh, learners will be able to understand the collaboration of uh, health professionals with the Nazi regime, and uh, they will be able to reflect on actions of uh, Jewish and non-Jewish healthcare professionals uh, in the Nazi era. They should also be able to identify and analyze ethical issues, concepts, and ideas uh, that were raised by medicine during Nazism and the Holocaust. And uh, additionally, they should be able to reflect on moral failures and uh, transgressions of uh, health professionals, medical establishments, and uh, scientific institutes, uh, and their role in uh, modern day bioethics. Uh, most importantly, they should be able to apply the insight uh, learned from this course to their personal context. And uh, one would wonder why we need to learn medicine, Nazism, and um, Holocaust in the African context. And uh, we need to learn that for history-informed uh, professional identity formation, uh, because we need to internalize the core values of our profession and live by it. We also need that to be able to reflect on uh, shining exemplars of moral courage and uh, to be able to also uh, understand implications for the African context and uh, learn from that history and avoid echoing it, echoing the bad. Uh, so this is uh, the course. It's uh, yet to be rolled out. Everything is set up. We got a learning management uh, system. It's going to be rolled out in the coming weeks. And uh, as I conclude, I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, Sabine, uh, Shmuel, and uh, Hedy for their immense contribution and um, offering to be faculty for the first African uh, course, Pro Bono. I would also like to uh, thank uh, World Continuing Education Alliance for offering us their platform uh, for the course. And um, I, would, uh, th I also want to thank uh, the Lancet Commission on Medicine and the Holocaust and uh, the Student Advisory Council for their support all along. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, last but not least, Yvonne Steinert, clinical psychologist and professor of family medicine and health sciences education, Richard and Sylvia Cruz Chair in Medical Education in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science at McGill University, Canada. Born in the Netherlands, she completed her undergraduate degree at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and her doctoral training at the University of Montreal. Her research focus is on undergraduate and postgraduate medical education, the design and delivery of faculty development programs, including the only book 
on the matter coming in the second edition soon, uh, and medical education research. Yvonne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction and for the privilege of being with you today. I am truly humbled. Because time is short, I will not cite individuals for acknowledgments, but I would really like to thank the Lancet, the co-chairs and the commissioners for all their hard work in preparing, planning and publishing this report. I also would like to thank all of you who have found the energy to stay with us in person and online. I'm reminded that Hervik Czech said that it was difficult to follow Richard Norton. I would agree, it's even more difficult to give the last presentation of the day. With that, I would also like to acknowledge our current context, which started on October 7th with the with the massacre of innocent Israelis and civilians, including babies, toddlers, young adults, men, women, and Holocaust survivors. It was also then followed on October 13th by a global call for the day of Jihad. And in my own city, in Montreal, Quebec, Jewish schools were closed for fear of an anti-Semitic act. A hospital that serves our Jewish community asked doctors to rearrange their schedules for non-urgent visits, again because of fears of security, and many Jewish homes took off their mezuzot. I say that because of the rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic acts and because I feel that the lessons learned of this report are timely, meaningful, and very relevant. I would also like to share with you a personal note. I am the daughter of survivors who met after the war. Both my parents came from Germany, from Frankfurt, and from Cologne. My mother hid in Bussum in the Netherlands, and my father hid in Drachten, in Friesland, also in the Netherlands. They were hidden by non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jews, truly the righteous of the nations. I am also the granddaughter and niece of uh, Raina Rosenberger, my grandmother, and Margot Engel and Robert Engel, who were all incarcerated in Westerbach, in Theresienstadt, and Bergen-Belsen. And they were liberated in 1945 at the end of the war. I grew up with frightening, devastating stories of the Holocaust that are still with me today and make this presentation so meaningful to me. Moving from an acknowledgement of our context and my personal background, I would like to enter the conversation around the Lancet report from an educational lens and talk to you about what I perceive are strengths of the report. I believe that the report met its objective eloquently and comprehensively in an evidence-based, well-referenced manner for many objectives, including the educational approaches, the ability to develop independent thinkers, and to help prepare current and future generations of health professionals to stand up against anti-Semitism and other forms of racism and discrimination. It also provided a detailed, rich summary of historical evidence what I like to call a compendium of learning. In addition, it outlined concrete recommendations for educators. And my personal hope in being here today is that people will read the report, think carefully about its recommendations, and implement educational curricula for all health professionals.
The report also provided robust teaching materials with sample uh, curricula in the appendices that Shmuel talked about and powerful case studies, as we see in so many of the panels, including that of Anita Andres, four years old with developmental delays, a victim from the Heidelberg Psychiatric University Hospital who was murdered as part of Carl Schneider's research program. We need to think, we need to read, and ensure that health professionals are aware of what might be possible. As I take the educational lens, I would like to address three major themes how this report fits into the broader context of medical and health professions education, pedagogical considerations that are both present and need to be considered, and the need for what I think is critical for effective dissemination and advocacy. I could easily talk to you till midnight about the broader, but I won't, no worries, about the broader context of medical education. However, for today, I will talk to you about the renewed emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion that I believe we are seeing more in North America than in other parts of the world. A focus on professional identity formation, which you have seen is core to the report and is also guided by the norms of the profession and the role of context that's so critically important in teaching and learning. We have seen this renewed emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the definition is here for you. What, however, what I would like to do is ask ourselves the following questions. And my hope is that some of you may have responses to this in our Q&A period. Where does anti-Semitism appear in the discourse of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why is anti-Semitism so often missing? And what, perhaps, is the role of white privilege and being an invisible minority in excluding anti-Semitism? In preparation for today, I looked at a large number of anti-racist, anti-oppressive curricula in the United States. And as you can see on this slide, the objectives are clear and the activities are clear. However, the notion of anti-Semitism, for example, are missing. Why is this and what can we do about that? I do believe that to move the agenda forward, we need clear definitions. There are different definitions available for anti-Semitism. But if we are to teach effectively, we must choose a definition that guides our program. It has been said that in order to teach, we need to define. It has also been said that in order to defeat, we need to define. And if we want, as part of our curricula, to address racism, anti-Semitism, and other forms of discrimination, we need clear definitions. We also need clear definitions in talking about professional identity. And I think many of us think professional identity is either who I am or how I am seen, and that is correct. But to move curricula forward, we need to carefully define what we mean by professional identity, as you see here on this slide, and also note that it is different from professionalism. Professionalism being a set of attributes and characteristics that underlie that professional identity. The expected norms of behavior and where we have seen egregious betrayal of those norms during the Holocaust. We need to understand professional identity and the formation of that professional identity. Professional identity formation has been defined as a staged developmental process whereby a professional identity evolves over time through the process of socialization, which I believe is commonly understood by many of you. 
the process by which a person learns to function within a particular society or group by internalizing its values and norms, sometimes negotiating, sometimes resisting, but eventually internalizing many of those values and norms. The questions I believe we need to ask ourselves is what is it about the process of socialization that leads to complicity? How do we ensure that the norms of the profession that we hold so dearly are understood and demonstrated? How can we, as educators, historians, sociologists, physicians, and other health professionals, impact this process of socialization with the end result of influencing our learners' sense of personal agency, their ability to feel that they can influence the world around them and their moral compass. For me, these questions are really much a part of a curriculum for teaching and learning in this area. The last theme related to the broader context of medical and health professions education is the importance of context, as we know that nothing happens in a vacuum and we must consider the context for teaching and learning and foster cultural safety for our learners. This relates to the learning environment. This relates to the country in which our teaching unfolds. If I were to teach at Ben Gurion University or at McGill University, how I pull the materials together would be very different. And we need to ensure that our students feel safe and feel that they can express themselves. We must consider the societal and cultural context in which this teaching occurs, as well as the context that gives rise to anti-Semitism and other forms of racism and discrimination. So the context of teaching and learning is critically important. And we should take the materials that have been so beautifully developed by the Lancet Commission and adapt them to our setting, knowing the norms, values, and beliefs. And with that, I would just like to compliment Emma on the program that she has developed for Kenya, knowing very well that that's a different cultural context than mine, for example, would be. The second major part of what I would like to talk about with my educational lens is the critical elements of curricular design. And again, we could talk about this for a very long time. However, I will talk about the question of standalone or integrated curricula, the clarification of objectives and faculty development in the time that we have this evening. Though I would like to take a moment to talk about the incredible value of having had a student advisory committee for the preparation of this report. And for me, that's what co-creation of curricula is all about. What can we do to ensure both student voices as well as the voices of Holocaust survivors as we heard earlier today? If we look at the recommendations in the report, there are many recommendations for specific programs, modules, or courses on this very important topic. I think that we should also consider the value of integrated curricula, where we look at content and integrate it over subject areas and in different learning experiences, which would allow for critical connections between theory and practice to be made, would enable holistic, authentic, meaningful learning, higher student engagement, which we see in the literature, enhanced problem solving, and more flexible and critical thinking, which I believe is an objective of this report. So I strongly recommend that we look at integrating curricula into our ongoing teaching and learning and perhaps conduct program evaluations to figure out where the learning is more powerful in standalone programs or in integrated curricula or as we often see in medical education research, A, B, C and all of the above. We also need to clarify our objectives as we teach. 
To me, it's very important that we articulate why we are teaching this content area, as speakers have done so well today. But we cannot assume that either our university, our medical school, our clinicians, our students will understand the rationale for teaching and learning. So we need to make it clear and be very articulate in that process. We need to enhance relevance and the link to contemporary issues, be it the Tuskegee experiments, as we heard about earlier, or be it the involuntary sterilization of Indigenous women in Canada. There are many contemporary examples that we need to bring into the conversation. We need to focus on the individual, but also the collective. For those of you who are health professionals, you will probably agree with me that much of your training focused on the individual, the doctor-patient, nurse-patient, health professional-patient relationship. We focus less on the collective and how we can advocate. That needs to be part of our objectives. As well, we need to emphasize application and skill. For we know that knowledge alone does not change practice. So as we learn about the history, as we read the case histories, how do we bring that into practice and foster skill acquisition? We also need faculty development. One of the things that we have observed over many years is that where faculty members are trained for their professions, they are often not trained to teach effectively. And I am delighted that tomorrow will be the start of a faculty development program for teaching fellows based on the Lancet report. We also need to ask ourselves, how do we prepare our faculty members to teach this content area? How do we engage them in capacity building? And how do we overcome common challenges, like competing with time for clinical work, time for research, time to attend meetings just like this? It's a particular challenge in medical and health professions education, but from my perspective, core to the success of the implementation of this report. Hetty Wald spoke of the study trips that she has taken with her students and has said, as responsible medical educators, we need to equip our learners with ethical vigilance, with a prepared mind and heart for the complexity of ethical dilemmas in medical practice and research. History, we hope, can help. We need to do the very same for our faculty members. There is so much to learn. The next piece of having the educational lens is to look at the educational challenges that we face. Teaching about the Holocaust, as I believe we have witnessed today and when we read the report, entails complex, voluminous content. Teaching about genocide can also be emotionally draining for teachers and for students. And we need to be aware of the emotional component of teaching and learning, knowing that we can overcome that challenge, but we must prepare for it. Often, too, we face a sense of disbelief as a significant barrier. In a seminar that was taught at McGill, students often said German physicians behaved as they did because they were madmen. They were not. And the myths that were so eloquently described to us earlier this afternoon really should be a basis for teaching and learning and for the conversation to start. And on a practical note, competition for curricular time is always a challenge. So how do we convince those in leadership positions that this is important? Lastly, I'd like to focus and talk about dissemination and advocacy. We must influence and educate and make sure that this report does not gather dust. I believe that the CIHR, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, knowledge to action cycle might be helpful in planning a dissemination and advocacy program and that it will help by ascertaining your target audience, by adapting knowledge to local contexts, by tailoring and implementing dissemination strategies. 
And for me, bite-sized summaries are a critical piece of successful dissemination. I also believe that the slides that were shown earlier today could be wonderful advanced organizers for teachers and learners before they try to grapple with the content of this report. We need to use online resources, which you heard about, as an example of a MOOC and diverse educational activities. And we must, in some way, show that this teaching and learning makes a difference. Moving forward, I believe we need to move beyond medicine to include all health professions. We need to move beyond health care. The lessons learned from the Nuremberg trials are relevant to so many, and we need to educate global research communities. We also need to attend to the systems and structures in which racism occurs. We hear about structural and systemic racism. We need to look at what we, as health professionals and individuals interested in this content area, can do. We need to conduct research in this area, as I have mentioned earlier, and teach and promote advocacy to prioritize human rights, that shared humanity that we talked about today, and fight anti-Semitism and other forms of racism. In summary, I believe the report is excellent, comprehensive, articulate, and very timely. The issues raised by the report map onto current issues in medical education. And for me, one of the most critical is to try to ensure that this teaching become a part of diversity, equity, and inclusion curricula. Principles of curricular design are key, as is the preparation of faculty members, which starts tomorrow. The teaching of this content area is absolutely critical as we have heard in many presentations, to the promotion of ethical conduct, moral agency, and professional identity formation. And as many have said, we must never forget, and we cannot be silent. In closing, I would like to pay tribute to my country, my family, and the Lancet Report. In 1995, Canada uh, printed this stamp to commemorate the Holocaust. The person in the white figure is my uncle, Robert Engel, who was part of this stamp in this commemoration, and what he said in 1945 is as true today as it was then. It is time for us to overcome the silence, and I see us doing that today. And lastly, from the Lancet Commission report, it is only through understanding and reflecting upon history that we can fully understand the present and shape a better future. So with that, I thank you all for your very kind attention. And as we are in Vienna, I say danke schön. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne, and that was a wonderful session. I know um, we're, we're running a bit behind. We did say we would have a Q&A, and we'll have time for a couple of uh, questions. Um, I, I think first we were going to offer the first um, uh, Q&A option, or the first uh, comment from Richard, I believe. If you wanted to say something, <laughs> <laughs> then the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I did want to make a few remarks, actually, having listened to everything today. Um, it's been a wonderfully rich discussion that's prompted me to reflect on several issues that I'd just like to return to. In Dan's talk, and I see Dan, you're still with us. Thank you for being with us. You quoted Zygmunt Bauman's uh, work on modernity and the Holocaust. And he wrote, at the back of that book, there's a lecture 
reprinted that he gave. And he writes in that lecture that in the aftermath of the Holocaust, it's untenable to view history as a triumph of humanity and reason over cruelty and depravity. That it's untenable to view modern society as a moralizing force or civilizing power. It's very easy to be frightened by our own age. I mentioned Joseph Roth at the, this, earlier this afternoon, and if you read his 1932 book, The Radetzky March, he writes this, the collapse of the world could easily, could already be seen as clearly as one sees a thunderstorm on the edge of a city. One of his concerns about what happened in the 1930s, which we've only tangentially touched on this afternoon, is the issue of nationalism. Roth wrote about the, a quote, awakening of national identity across Europe. A man who loves his nation, he wrote, renounces European solidarity. The pride of being born in a particular country he went on, annihilates the feeling of European universality. And he predicted that excessive nationalism would lead to, his words, a great devastation. But the message of this commission is that each of us shares an identity, not as a pat patchwork of discrete, distinct and competing nations, but as a pluralistic assembly of individuals, all of equal worth, based contemporary political divisions, based as they are so often on excessive and even a deformed sense of nationalism often foster overtly racist language. Sinophobia, as China emerges as a more powerful and influential neighbor, the denial of the indigenous voice, as we recently saw in the vote in Australia, and vile othering as people move from country to country desperately seeking a new and hopeful life for their families. We've rightly heard several times today about the terrifying context of our meeting, the October the 7th massacre by Hamas, the war crime of hostage taking, and how that experience has conjured up once, to, once again the idea of a Holocaust. Israelis and the Jewish people worldwide are in terrible pain. But I want to draw on the universal lessons of this commission to also say that so are the Palestinian people. We have two peoples in indescribable pain. And I hope that we can acknowledge this dual tragedy in the true spirit of the commission's findings and conclusions. It was Emmanuel Levinas, a French writer and philosopher of Lithuanian Jewish ancestry, who once wrote about morality being a moment of generosity, that our ethics of living can only be built through face-to-face -face interaction and understanding. And that, for me, is my parting reflection from this commission, that I hope we can replace Distance with proximity, fear with trust, and silence with love. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So now we're wondering if there are any questions uh, for uh, anyone who spoke today. Um, including in the earlier session, uh, during the launch or during the symposium. If you do have a question, we have a microphone here. 
um, and can bring it to you. I know Harrowick has some online also. We can start with, start with that as well. Yeah, that's why we are two, because I have to take care of the online <laughs> questions. So we, we do have some praise for Dan, uh, excellent lecture. This was one comment. Um, we also have congratulations from Howard Israel, who was, of course, very important and instrumental that this was uh, possible at all. Um, we have the very practical question, if this event will be recorded and then shared, I can share with you that this will be indeed the case, provided all speakers send their authorizations. It's a friendly reminder. <laughs> we have a comment from Elisabeth Preinin. We should also take into account the economic aspect of the T4 Aktion during the Third Reich, which meant no life for economically useless persons, Lebensunwertes Leben uh, meant this, so in the sense that uh, this was the, the, the the meaning of life unworthy of living. That's more of a comment, I don't know if anyone wants to elaborate on this. But uh, I think it's very much in accordance uh, with the interpretation we present in our uh, report. A few more comments, I think we Do you have a question? Here? There's an actual like question. A question. Here, here you go, hold on. I'm never at a loss for words. Um, I would love to hear uh, both from Anna and also from any of the others who've spoken today more about this idea of tailoring what it is you're teaching to the local or national environment. And so I can imagine, uh, of course, for all of Africa might be different than a course for South Africa or a course for Namibia or a course for Rwanda. Um, and I'm, I would love to hear some examples of how that course has been tailored to, you know, do, does it talk about tribalism? Does it talk about caste? Does it talk about anti-black racism in Germany? Uh, does it, right, there are those kinds of very specific um, ways in which there may be resonances um, or even aspects of the history that are especially applicable um, within that context. And I, and I think we heard a little about this with the Unit 731 experience. What would something like this look like tailored to um, Brazil? What would something tailored to uh, Japan? What would, I, 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 would, I would like to start to better wrap my head around because I've, I've thought a lot about this in terms of the US, right? But I haven't really given that much thought to what if I were trying to tailor this teaching um, or education on this for contemporary relevance to any number of other countries around the world. I'd be happy to quickly address that to take the pressure away from Emma to improvise here. Uh, so this is an introductory module, right? The very first one, and I, that's actually exactly what uh, what uh, uh, Shmuel also showed in the way we are going to develop these curricula. You start small, right? So we looked for anything that actually was written about <laughs> the connections between uh, the the uh, uh, African experience and specifically uh, na uh, National Socialism and uh, the Holocaust. We found a few things. We weren't very happy about all of that. And so we, we, uh, we uh, tried to pick some newer uh, literature that referred to this, right? But not much. You saw we have maybe five, six references here because that's a starter course, right? And we hope to build from there and then make it specific to the individual country. Right, but you also have to see if the, what the exactly what the what, what the national con context will be then in the individual parts of that particular continent, which is a huge continent, right? But you got to start somewhere. So, and I think the main message I w would like to say is just get started with one small module and then build from there. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I, well, I have a few things to say about it. So Emma was very initiative and she did an, an amazing uh, work with her course, but 
I'd like to say that all of the SACs have created some kind of project, they are working on them, and, and each of them uh, uh, is trying to, to do it in a rel in re like relevant to the place where they live and their specific communities. Um, and because I've worked with all of them, what we try to do um, is begin with, with thinking of what are the, the, the local uh, implications, what are the local echoes, and build from that. Like, start with looking at your own culture. And then we understood that in Canada, for example, they're facing a lot of anti-Semitism and, and the community, the non-Jewish community does not understand that it is anti-Semitism. And when we talked about, <coughs> about Spain, we understood that there, there is enough uh, 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 going on educationally there, but there's not enough faculty development and they need to collect it all together. So for each country, we kind of tailored what is, is needed there. And of course, Emma took on a whole continent and it's kind of hard. Um, and, and as Sabina said, like start small. So that's in the comment of the SAC. Uh, on the report, it's what we re recommend is to start small. You don't have to build a course overnight. You can start with giving one lecture, with creating a, a, a peer group to discuss what you're experiencing in your clinical uh, uh, life and, and practice. So start small and build up. Thank you, Shani. I, actually, I just want to check if there's other questions. For I know you had something to say in response. Was sentence. it a question or was it? One, okay. one okay. sentence just to on this. I just wanted to emphasize, based on many of the talks here today, that the general principles of the work, when they are implemented, the students with facilitated critical reflection, with proper faculty development, make it their own. They make it, they bring it to local relevance. So that yes, we can bring some material, but we also can trust the learners in that way to work with this because the basic principles inform the learning. Thanks. Um, I think we have time for, for one other question, uh, if there are any other questions. Do you have a question? Okay, let me just check if there are any other questions first. And if not, you're welcome to have the, the last word. <laughs> That's great. I think just to answer your question and also, uh, yes, hi, uh, I am Rona Kvarma from India, a member of the Student Advisory Council. And I think I just wanted to make an observation that where this was one of the key challenges that we were discussing as the SAC, as the SAC, that when we were trying to draw parallels for different countries, one of the main observations we came through was modern medicine was not, not as devel developed in other parts of the world as it was in Europe in the mid-1950s. So this was one of the major problems it came uh, when we were drawing parallels, because in other countries, it was not as developed to be used as a tool for mass atrocity. This does not mean there were not mass atrocities in other parts of the world. Like, for example, in India during war, uh, Winston Churchill, he starved the entire state of Bengal to fund the war. But that does not relate to medicine and the Holocaust. So this was one of the major challenges that we were, we were facing and still facing. How do we make it relevant to that particular area while focusing on medicine and the Holocaust? Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a perfect way to end on the, the words of our engaged and, and valued Student Advisory Council. Um, this afternoon has run its course. Um, it has been a, a long afternoon, but of course a much longer ride to get this uh, uh, report ready and, and published. I think some of us have not realized it yet. Uh, it's been online since this morning, actually. Um, so. 
I think uh, all that rests to me now is to uh, close this session. I want to thank everyone who made this possible. The audience also online, Dan Michmann stuck around, I see you uh, on my screen. Um, and of course, everyone who was so instrumental to making this possible, the work in the commission, it was an incredible experience. The students on the advisory council, the speakers today, the team of the Lancet, an incredible privilege to, to be uh, able to work with a medical journal so closely. Um, normally it's a very well, a different relationship, every one of you uh, knows it. Richard Horton, Miriam Sabin, who put an incredible amount of energy and power into this uh, project, Sabine Kleinert. And uh, of course, I would also like to uh, thank the staff. I have received some credit for organizing this. Actually, I had a very little part in this. Clemens Jobs did most of the tough work. <laughs> the, staff, the staff from the Josephinum, so here from our own uh, institution, the people next door who took care of uh, all of this running smoothly. Many hands and eyes were necessary to make this possible today. So I thank you all again, and this is closing remarks, Mul. <laughs> okay. Uh, an applause for her week. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, that's it, I'm not going to drop it, but uh, <laughs> thank you, good night. <laughs>